uh, start recording. Yes, I wish I could show you guys the face I just made hearing that robot voice. Uh, all right, uh, today I will be talking about kind of childhood drama, sexuality, and knowledge of evil, and Henry James's The Turn of the Screw, uh, and it's kind of film adaptations, uh, which takes us through, I think, 1961 through 2021. Uh, I'm uh, Max Reese. I'm Skazka 9000, uh, most places on the internet and uh, on Twitter. And I would love to <laughs> take you through a, a substantial list of content notes here first. Uh, front and center, I'm going to be dealing fairly frequently uh, with kind of discussion of sexual assault and rape culture. Uh, there is one uh, screen cap in here that I realized too late is an actual depiction of kind of filmed uh, fil film scrimshot of a scene of physical violence by, uh, by a man toward a woman. Uh, if that's something that you'd rather not, you'd rather not see, you can tap out when we're discussing uh, the 2009 adaptation briefly. Uh, we're going to be dealing with kind of child sexual abuse, including uh, sexual abuse between children and kind of uh, uh, sexual abuse within the family. I'm also going to be dealing with kind of non-sexual trauma. Uh, the big one is bereavement and kind of witnessing violence or witnessing violent death, witnessing intimate partner abuse. Uh, and also kind of various forms of neglect in the course of uh, kind of the treatments of this story. I'm also going to be dealing kind of relatively less, relatively less so, but still uh, substantially with kind of intimate partner abuse and uh, verbal abuse, uh, medical legal attitudes toward assault in the 19th century, which are not generally not great. Uh, I'm going to try and get past, get through that relatively quickly. Uh, kind of canon typical child death, animal harm, suicide mentions. Uh, and one screenshot with a bug. Uh, if you need a heads up, it's the second slide talking about the innocence, but it's a, it's a beautiful iconic shot, but it's not everybody's cup of tea necessarily. All right, I'm gonna begin. Uh, kind of giving you a little bit of background on kind of where I'm coming from here. I'm um, kind of a historian of, uh, generally I do early modern stuff and that's kind of where my, my history of sexuality background comes from and kind of from uh, early modern drama is kind of a precursor in a, in, a, in a big way to kind of some of the elements that we end up with in the Gothic, uh, but kind of also talking a little bit about uh, the depictions, especially of sexuality and gender uh, in the film adaptations uh, through the lens of kind of the history of film, through what is happening over the course of the, the second half of the 20th century in uh, what can be depicted on, on uh, a cinema released film in the US and kind of what's uh, what's the norm in filmmaking. I really like the Gothic in general. And I think in this case, I'm inclined to use the Gothic as kind of a lens through which to view the, the gender relations in this story, but also kind of the treatment of trauma as kind of a, an adjunct of, you know, the, the history of disability and trauma studies are also kind of big areas for me, which informs certainly the way that people talk about this novel in terms of uh, madness or mental illness. So right off the top, I don't I don't really think that the turn of the screw is unambiguously a story about anything, <laughs> and that kind of ambiguity and all encompassingness uh, kind of really drives the interest the the enduring interest of it for me. Uh, it's kind of been described as a literary mystery, something where the central ambiguities are a feature and not a bug. Kind of the sense of you know are the ghosts real or not? Is the governess sane or not? Kind of un you know, are the children innocent or not is kind of uh, questions that do not necessarily get a decisive answer in the text and that various adaptations uh, kind of fall on different sides of or kind of maintain that balls in the air uh, ambiguity. Um, I kind of chose this reading because I feel like it it kind of illuminates both the, the children and the governess kind of by two sides of the same light. Kind of the governess is the kind of the scrutinizing witness as well as the, ch uh, the children is kind of the, the uh, almost like the battleground of the moral conflict that she's seeking to locate there. And the children is kind of uh, really exposing the darkness of seeing children as little adults as they kind of play act adult behaviors. Uh, but at the same time, kind of there's a real, uh, wide smorgasbord of possible interpretations of this text and a lot of those uh, a lot of those will be getting mileage in kind of the film section later on uh, but I want to kind of keep it open that this is very much one lens through which I view the text rather than a decisive 
a decisive argument that this text is centrally about child trauma or about a particular form of child trauma. Also, when we kind of, once again, hashing out what I'm covering and what I'm not covering, I will not be covering kind of non-Anglophone, non-US, UK based adaptations uh, of which there are a couple, I wanna say in, in the 1980s, the 1990s and the 2000s, this really gets kind of a global, uh, a global explora exploration, which is kind of cool. I won't be talking about Benjamin Britten's opera at all or any of its film stagings or uh, kind of films that riff on its staging, which is an interesting subgenre of its own. I uh, won't be dealing with kind of turn of the screw inspired cinema like The Others or uh, even Crimson Peak draws very much from the innocence in many respects. And I won't be dealing with kind of literary riffs on those trauma themes, just kind of strictly with uh, what ends up on screen. All right, in terms of the history of turn of the screw as it's kind of its conception as a story, uh, it was kind of commissioned by Collier's Weekly uh, from Henry James in I think I want to say, yep, 1898. It's right there, right in front of me. Um, in 1898, it's kind of part of their uh, uh, winter months treatment of kind of exciting stuff in the arts happening over uh, the Christmas season. It's kind of a traditional spooky season. Uh, it's 24 chapters that are, it was originally serialized in 12 parts, but those 12 parts are paradoxically not evenly divided among those 12, among those 24 parts at all. <laughs> it's very much uh, divided in whatever way uh, James saw as most uh, narratively dramatic rather than in accordance with kind of the, the numerical divisions of the text. Uh, and the version who people are most generally familiar with is the version that was revised for publication in 1908 uh, with a kind of a bevy of changes to the text, many minor, others not so minor, uh, but that is the version uh, kind of upon which I'll be drawing uh, rather than rather than kind of its initial serialized form. Uh, and in terms of Henry James, how he talks about this piece himself, uh, he very much talks about it in terms of suggestion and suspicion uh, and kind of feeling things that you cannot articulate or suspecting things that you cannot name, uh, which is very suited to the more apprehensive side of uh, gothic horror, I would say kind of is it in terms of how people divide that into, you know, the anticipation versus the actuality of the event, kind of the, the horror rather than terror, uh, the anticipation rather than the aftermath. But that also kind of in for me backs up the uh, kind of textual understanding as one that is largely about kind of uh, attempts to detect uh, something that is not uh, not entirely nameable. Um, right off the bat, I'm going to give the super, try and make this one super quick, a super quick summary of uh, what's happening at the turn of the screw. Um, there's a framing narrative to it that I find quite interesting. It's, you know, a group of, un, you know, largely unnamed friends kind of swapping Christmas ghost stories. Uh, the hook and kind of the source of the title, uh, one of the ghost stories that is shared off screen before we arrive is a ghost story that involves a child. Uh, there's the idea of, you know, okay, so one child cranks up the apprehension of the ghost story to one degree. How how much would two children in peril crank up uh, kind of the peril of the the story and kind of the, the listener's anticipation? And one of the attendants of this group uh, kind of tantalizes with the idea of this account uh, in manuscript form that he possesses by uh, the governess formerly of a friend who... Uh, kind of had this strange experience when she was young, naive and untested. Uh, the governess kind of, she she starts off pretty young and pretty, uh, in her mind, she sees herself as a, a representative of her, her field of the governess. She's respectable. She's kind of in need of money, but at the same time, she's a very morally upright young individual uh, kind of coming at this with the purest intentions. Uh, she's hired by kind of a, a hunky Harley Street bachelor uh, to take care of the children who he has kind of inherited from his uh, dead relations, his kind of the, the mother and father of the children passed away in India uh, under 19th century circumstances that are not specified. And he's kind of come by this young, this particularly the young girl, but also kind of a, a young boy who he's trying to shuttle off to school as much as he can. Uh, upon the governess's arrival, she meets Flora, who is eight, but mysteriously is described as uh, sitting in a high chair and needing a bib, which suggests to me that either perhaps 
uh, James did not initially intend for her to be as old as she is, or he does not know that much about uh, children, uh, or perhaps something else. But uh, shortly, the governess kind of encounters Miles, who's home, theoretically, I think home on summer holidays, but his arrival kind of comes with this uh, swiftly on its heels, kind of this notice that he will not be allowed back at school, and that he's kind of being expelled for, again, kind of un unexplained but highly suggestive reasons. Uh, the governess kind of touches base with the housekeeper, who she considers to be kind of a morally upright, uh, harmless, innocent, kind of uh, respectable person. And from her, she manages to extract relevant information about kind of her predecessor. And when the governess starts kind of in having more overt spectral encounters, kind of against the landscape of this house that she considers to be kind of almost a fairy tale castle, uh, she kind of connects with Gross to both to convey what she has seen because she initially believes that it's a trespasser, like a, a human living trespasser on the grounds who potentially uh, is up to no good uh, and finds finds out relatively quickly that the man that she's describing is uh, Peter Quint, kind of the previous, previous kind of uh, valet and man around the estate uh, for the, for Bly's kind of master and a generally all around uh, reprehensible character uh, who's kind of, you know, handsome but depraved and in every way not a gentleman. Uh, as such, kind of the governess quickly connects the presence of Quint with kind of the downfall of her predecessor who kind of left under a dark cloud and shortly thereafter died. Uh, and she's kind of on the hunt for any indication that these kind of supernatural appearances are visible to the children or that uh, kind of Quentin Jessel have had a lingering moral impression on the children that she kind of seeks to scrub out. Uh, her inquiries kind of take the point of finding the children's reticence to discuss. Uh, they're not, you know, talking about uh, uh, Quint and Jessel offhandedly. They're kind of relatively keeping to themselves. Uh, and she finds this inherently suspicious. She kind of probes into uh, an incident where she believes that Flora uh, sees Jessel's ghost and is kind of communicating with it. Uh, Flora has a nervous breakdown and starts cussing her out. And kind of her her difficult her uh, kind of difficult response and her ensuing kind of hysterics uh, are deeply troubling to Gross and kind of result in uh, Flora being kind of rem removed from the residence and kind of taken into uh, taken into town for kind of further care. As a result, the governess is now alone with Miles and she kind of resolves herself that she wants to know why he was expelled and he, she wants to know the extent of his connection with Quint, if Quint is still in contact with him from beyond the grave. Uh, she kind of, in an effect, corners him a little bit on this one and kind of pushes Miles uh, very much to the edge of his comfort level in discussing the matter. Uh, it kind of, she gets an answer, but not necessarily a straight answer about why he was expelled from school. We know that it's because of something that he said, and it was something that he says he said to the children that he liked. Uh, and then kind of the matter before she can, before she can really get a satisfactory uh, full answer from him, uh, Quint's ghost kind of intrudes. The governess, uh, the governess frames her response as, you know, shielding Miles with her body from Quint while Miles is striving uh, to kind of see or reach Quint. Uh, but at any rate, Miles dies in her arms, and it is a downer ending on a couple levels. But that is kind of the the overview from which all these adaptations will be drawing. A little bit briefly about the James family. Um, Henry James is, you know, an Anglo-American novelist, correspondent, kind of very prolific uh, correspondent with his fellow writers and also kind of with uh, some of the same social circles that William James engages in. William James is kind of a pioneering uh, psychologist during this time period, uh, kind of, uh, I guess I'm a medical pioneer in that field, especially in terms with the psychology of uh, persons who are not suffering under immediate uh, mental distress. Uh, and he's also very into psychical research, which is a big uh, kind of gentleman's dabbling field during this time period. It's kind of a distinct, a distinct scientific way of inquiring into uh, supernatural events or kind of uh, what we now kind of call, you know, parapsychology, that kind of field. It's very much the, the semi-scientific approach 
uh, to those events uh, by men of science in the occasional woman of science in the 19th century. Uh, their sister, Alice James, she's kind of a more present kind of in this text as a shadow. Uh, she's uh, dealt with kind of lifelong disability and illness, uh, had kind of uh, emotionally intense and complex relationships with other women. And she's also kind of uh, a prolific diary writer as she deals with kind of physical and mental illness that seems in many ways connected with uh, her upbringing and her family experience as kind of lots of lots of mental illness stuff in my understanding is that's certainly been been, been my experience but she's kind of the 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 James family member who has had to be kind of excavated uh, from obscurity by especially kind of scholars of disability and uh, fem uh, feminist uh, historians. In terms of, oh, did I miss? No, I didn't. I should have put that in the other order. Uh, I want to talk about kind of turn in the light of the Gothic. In many ways, the connections between the turn of the screw as a novella and kind of the old school Gothic are relatively, uh, relatively lucid and relatively called out in the text. The governess uh, in, in chapter four, she names dro name drops uh, Udolfo as kind of this byword for uh, Gothic hidden secrets and uh, the idea of an unmentionable relative kept in unexpected, unsuspected uh, confinement evokes for me Jane Eyre among others, kind of this idea that uh, there may be, uh, the secret may be kind of supernatural, but it may also simply be kind of at a high, at a high emotional pitch uh, in kind of the Gothic mode. The governess is very much a figure kind of both of uh, Gothic, Gothic fiction uniquely and kind of 19th century fiction about uh, you know, governesses in peril and governesses as kind of permissible, uh, permissible middle class heroines and uh, arbiters of goodness in many ways. The isolated estate is definitely a, a central Gothic aspect. The house itself, Bly, really seems to charm her and capture capture the governess's imagination. There's also kind of the the idea of kind of medieval esque or medieval inspired. Uh, architecture at Bly, including the tower at which uh, uh, Quint is initially cited. Uh, sexy bad men are definitely central to this story, both uh, in kind of a more passive badness, uh, the bachelor uncle, but also in a very active sense, uh, Quint and even perhaps Miles is kind of a little man. Uh, there's also a very strong element of sexual intrigue, kind of the specter of uh, murder is present with the death of Quint, definitely an ambiguous and mysterious death uh, that warrants kind of a, a dark, a dark pall of its own over Bly, uh, as well as suicide, kind of the potential that uh, Jessel uh, died from suicide and that that's kind of the element of why she appears to be kind of damned to haunt the earth. Uh, it's also due to kind of its framing device, we get a step back from immediate kind of contemporary 1898 uh, Victoriana. We get a kind of a, a generation or so uh, backward so that we can kind of comment on previous decades kind of values with a little bit of, <laughs> a little bit of perspective, but also kind of the nice remove of it being essentially a period piece within those terms, that things that aren't necessarily acceptable or plausible in the modern day suddenly become more accessible and more plausible when they're more antique, which is certainly something that we see in the illustrations that initially accompanied uh, the, the print version of Turn of the Screw. Kind of the, the textual origin uh, for the haunting uh, featured in the Turn of the Screw uh, derives from this kind of ghost anecdote that E.W. Benson, kind of at that time, the Archbishop of Canterbury, kind of uh, head of the Benson clan uh, relates to Henry James uh, in 1895, kind of in a classic two dude swap and ghost stories uh, milieu. Uh, he relates that this is the story which has ostensibly been told to him by a woman and as a result he has only kind of the woman's choice details that she chose to gave him. And then this account of you know young children uh, being depraved uh, by their by their wicked uh, servants who have been they've been left in their care uh, after the death of their parents. You get kind of the the wicked servants, the threat of the servants depraving the children. The children themselves become uh, bad, full of evil to a sinister degree, uh, and also the idea that these servants are seeking to destroy the children in a way that is, to be frank, much more unambiguous than the 
kind of intimations of destruction that we get in Turn of the Screw itself, the idea that these children are being lured into dangerous places uh, with the intention of destroying them and perhaps, you know, preventing them from going to heaven when they die. Um, this is kind of very much related by an outside observer. And there's also notably no governess figure uh, in this story that we're told. It is very much uh, just a story of some children and some servants. There's no outside observer uh, who tries to intervene on the children's behalf, which suggests to me that the governess is almost in the hearer's position. Uh, the hearer's response of, well, that's terrible. Like somebody should have stopped that, but also like, woof, ghosts. Uh, she's kind of interjected in this story as it slowly kind of takes shape in James's writing into its ultimate form. I want to come back once again to kind of the theme of ambiguity and suggestion in this text. Uh, ambiguity and suggestion are big kind of uh, benefits for, I would say, horror writing in that uh, you can get away with quite a bit that you can't necessarily show head on in a particular medium if you're operating under either constraints of decorum or kind of constraints of active censorship rather than merely moral censure. Uh, and he, uh, Henry James kind of really, really indicates to me, especially in his preface and in his writing around Turn of the Screw, he indicates a very much a full awareness uh, that there are very kind of disturbing possibilities of the account of evil that he's presenting, but also he's kind of washing his hands of it by being able to say that, no, no, like it's in the reader's mind uh, how bad the reader chooses to make this, that it's only as bad or as perilous as uh, the reader's own imagination uh, can kind of fill in. Um, and I think that that's both in some ways a very effective in terms of providing alternate readings, especially as the reader's the reader's kind of bank of evil things that might take place maybe expands or contracts. But at the same time, as, as James says, you are released from weak specifications. Uh, he does not have to specify uh, what the bad things were that the servants were up to in case it's a disappointment. You don't necessarily have to come up with something that's so shocking that you can't print it or something that's so weak sauce that people are disappointed that, oh no, they were just teaching them to smoke cigarettes. Like that's all. Uh, but at the same time, the, the bank of kind of parallel stories that the reader is expected to be bringing to the table here is in some ways very kind of of its time period. Some of these are evoked directly in the text, whereas others are kind of merely thematically present. Uh, and it's definitely kind of, I would say, kind of parochial to, um, you know, white people in the US and Great Britain at this time of a certain social class. The idea that we're drawing from Gothic novels, kind of sensation novels about, you know, mysteries, secrets, scandals, uh, but also fairy tales. Fairy tales are a stronger, stronger presence in this text than I think I sometimes remember in terms of how, uh, both how the governess conceptualizes Bly and how she kind of understands her role as the guardian of these children. There's also kind of the parallel narratives of explanation or recourse for kind of the ideas of evil or the ideas of kind of supernaturally enduring spirits. Uh, Christianity is the big one. The governess is a clergyman's daughter and she very much brings kind of uh, 19th century English Protestant kind of vaguely evangelical sentiments to the table here, evangelical in the, the 19th century sense. She's very uh, scrupulous and kind of self-examining, but that may just be the, the overall tone of what she's inherited from the past decades. Uh, but there's also kind of the lens of spiritualism, the idea that spectral contacts might not necessarily be, uh, that they could be malicious, but that they're perhaps more normal uh, than they're expected to be, and that they're not kind of bound by the Hamlet problem of how can you trust a dead person who might have come from hell. Uh, but there's also kind of the lens of psychical research, which James claims that he's kind of uh, dismissing this lens in his preface in 1908. But it seems pretty clear to me that he draws from kind of the, the physical case studies drawn from psychical research at the same time as he uh, claims that he's claims that he's writing a kind of a moral drama rather than a scientific uh, science fiction story. All right, I'm going to deal with um, kind of the the themes of childhood trauma and uh, sexual abuse here. I kind of want to uh, turn to here, trying to keep this relatively brief, but this is certainly kind of the site of where a lot of the a lot of the the subtext that informs this story. Uh, 
is drawn from this area for me. And it's also an area where I want to kind of, I want to kind of counteract the idea that I occasionally encounter in criticism of turn that uh, people in the 19th century were not aware of sexual abuse or that they did not, their understandings of trauma were very odd and ropey and often kind of uh, struggling to struggling to conceptualize something in terms of the nerves rather than we'd now consider it, you know, uh, the brain or the psyche or trauma or kind of uh, self-image or brain chemistry. Uh, they were kind of dealing with the presupposition that trauma must must involve the nerves somehow uh, due to kind of a general nerve preoccupation. Uh, but at the same time, they were certainly aware of uh, sexual assault as a crime and uh, sexual abuse of children. These are things that are very much, uh, even though they're kind of often dealt with with great discomfort uh, in 19th century contexts, these were realities of kind of the 19th century world as much as they are of our own. And uh, as, as far as we've come in terms of acknowledgement of that as an issue and kind of institutional responses, it certainly was not below the institutional radar in the 19th century, the way that some people might might find it more comfortable to imagine in the context of trying to do historically grounded readings of Turn of the Screw. In terms of kind of my definitions of trauma that I'm working off of, uh, kind of the central one that I'm drawing from here is very much the idea both of uh, a real or perceived threat to life, bodily integrity, or that of like a loved one, uh, but also the idea that the emotional experience of the individual is overwhelmed, that they're kind of uh, customary framework, their customary self-image uh, has very much received a jolt in the course of this, and that has to be kind of reconfigured. Uh, for children, kind of in the context of the DSM-5's current, current kind of uh, conceptualization of trauma, which certainly is not the be-all and end-all, and certainly will be uh, changed in the future as everything in the DSM is, uh, the kind of stipulation there that for a child, a sexually violent event that threatens their bodily integrity uh, need not necessarily involve overt violence, that it can involve inappropriate sexual experiences that stop short of physical violence, which is in some ways something that in the 19th century was um, conceptualized in terms of like moral, uh, taking kind of a moral damage, damage to your morality, but it was not something that they were really really prepared to handle in terms of uh, development for the child's own sake. And that's something that uh, is very much an, an underlying preoccupation here. In terms of kind of relevant childhood experiences in terms of the text, these are kind of drawn from the Na National Child Traumatic Stress Network. This is cherry picked from a much bigger list that deals with often things like warfare, or natural disaster as kind of positioning, uh, positioning the child in a position of uh, vulnerability uh, and physical physical danger, essentially, as well as to that, that of their family. Uh, but in terms of turn, I definitely want to talk about kind of sexual abuse or assault, certainly with the, the figures of uh, Quentin Jessel, but potentially kind of from other vectors, uh, emotional abuse, psychological maltreatment, which is uh, not in terms of uh, neglect of physical needs, since the children appear to be relatively well appointed at Bly, but certainly in terms of uh, both in the, um, the emotional neglect they receive from their theoretical guardian and kind of the uh, questionable psychological treatment they've received from individuals like uh, Quentin Jessel, as well as the governess herself in the course of the story. Um, there's also the idea of being witness to domestic violence. This is very much something that dovetails with uh, the novel and the governess's preoccupation with what the children have seen the idea that even if they were not the direct recipients of physical violence from Quint, that they may have witnessed him being violent toward other people, including toward their beloved governess, uh, Miss Jessel. Uh, there's also the idea of a more broad kind of witness to violence, interpersonal violence or death. Uh, a couple adaptations draw on the idea of the children discovering Jessel's body when she passes away or kind of being witness even to the death of Quint. Uh, certainly to the death of their parents is a theme that we get recurring, but uh, that kind of draws me to, you know, traumatic grief and separation, both the death of their parents and the loss of uh, two of their previous caregivers to whom they seem to have been emotionally attached as an element of these children's experience. 
Right off the bat, I do want to say that I'm not going to be talking so much about kind of post-traumatic experience or necessarily kind of emotional disturbance as a consequence of trauma. That can certainly be read in the text and it can be read certainly in adaptations that's very much made more legible there. Uh, but I want to be kind of dealing with almost trauma for its own sake, that it is something that is troubling because of the kind of the jolt that it uh, the jolt to the kind of the individual's sense of self and to their physical integrity that it results in and as something that needs to be discussed even if it doesn't seem to uh, or something that needs to be able to be acknowledged if desired rather than kind of shut up under a cloud of silence uh, which is very much uh, very much one of the elements of this story that it gets kind of locked up under it's so a question of, you know, did contemporary readers see sexual abuse in this text or kind of any element of, oh goodness. Sorry, I just, sorry, checking in, checking in on the chat. I apologize uh, if uh, somebody has just lost their audio. This is kind of the big question for kind of a, a certain historical approach to can you impute these themes to this text? There's one way of thinking where you could say like, well, the Victorians didn't know about sexual abuse or they didn't know uh, about uh, kind of sexual engagement with children causing that child harm, then of course they wouldn't have been able to locate it in this text, which I don't believe is true and definitely doesn't, uh, doesn't reflect kind of medical and legal understandings of that time, but it's also not in line with what we're seeing, even in positive reviews of Turn as a text. Uh, people really responded in a positive way to the story. There's kind of this body of professional reviewing content uh, from contemporary, often like contemporary newspapers where people are very profusely enthusiastic about the horror elements of the story and how successful they were and kind of conveying a sense of something really, uh, really kind of new and freshly terrible in a ghost narrative. Uh, but the language that they use to kind of praise James's ability to draw out uh, appropriately creepy ghost stuff is almost indistinguishable in some cases from condemning the story itself. It's very much the language of, you know, oh, the story is ghastly, the story is repulsive. And it's like in a good way or a bad way, <laughs> because it can certainly be understood as both. But we get at least one review that is kind of cited in this in this corpus of immediate critical responses from the independent in 1899 kind of in the in the spring of the next year uh, where the reviewer is certainly more put off by uh kind of the, the content of child harm and uh kind of imperiled childhood innocence in this story and the idea of you know the feeling after perusal of this horrible story is that one has been assisting in an outrage upon the holiest and sweetest fountain of human innocence and helping to debauch at least by helplessly standing by uh, the pure and trusting nature of children and this language in a 19th century context is certainly loaded uh, both the language of outrage and the language of debauch but also the idea of uh, children is kind of the sweetest fountain of human innocence children is pure and trusting uh, which kind of tees up uh, some very, very front and center ideas about kind of the sacrosanct uh, purity of children as something that is under in this story under attack, not in a different way uh, than an adult's uh, integrity might be. Um, hmm, I guess kind of a general overview of kind of those same ideas of childhood is this. Uh, pure, innocent kind of fountain of human goodness stage that, that uh, children kick off in. Uh, this is definitely a very class-bound phenomenon, this kind of the idea of the Victorian cult of the child, though it sometimes deigns to kind of encompass working class children, this is very much kind of a middle class end up uh, supposition of childhood innocence. Uh, it's very much something that is assumed, you know, if you're working in a mill, or if you live in one room with all of your brothers and sisters and your parents, or if you have to work in a public facing job from a young age, you are not attributed kind of the qualities of innocence and wholesomeness that other children are afforded uh, to the same degree. Uh, kind of there's a, a valorization of the child as kind of this emblem of the middle class family, kind of the center of the woman's world and kind of the father's crowning achievement in terms of uh, things he can uh, claim responsibility for despite having very little hand in the raising of uh, and kind of children as this 
children is existing in this kind of pre-sexual state before adult concerns. Uh, and the adult kind of nostalgia for childhood is this simpler time where they didn't have the responsibilities and inhibitions that they possess now, uh, which for me is at odds with uh, kind of the way that I experience childhood is a very complex, fraught time of life of great vulnerability and kind of peril, uh, but also uh, the it's very, very much colored by hindsight. The idea that children experience childhood is a state of simplicity and not a state of kind of confusing ambiguity. Uh, there's also this idea, which I would say like continues to this day, that kind of childhood is this formative moral time, uh, but the 19th century kind of uh, Christianity inflicted ideas of appropriate moral education for children definitely looks at odds from kind of the contemporary understanding of a more uh, perhaps more secular and more kind of psych psychology informed ethics of interactions uh, between children and the world around them. There's also a big, I was going to just do a really poor choice of words there. There is a large fixation on uh, kind of the beauty of the child again, kind of in this middle-class framework uh, during this time period, which can get very weird and creepy very fast to kind of a modern reader and indeed to some contemporaries. Like it was, there's this somewhat unsettling edge where the child is held up as this beacon of kind of, you know, uh, innocence, purity, kind of a pure, natural, beautiful body and a pure, natural, beautiful, trusting, innocent soul that kind of inherently suggests intentions that are incompatible with the vulnerability of that child, kind of the adult. The adult is projecting uh, elements onto this child that are not necessarily in the child's own consciousness. This is something we get in a big kind of the rise of nude photography of children, either in a sentimentalized way or a more frankly erotic way during this century is certainly something that kind of people who consider themselves to be artists certainly take up. And that is in it, kind of its most benign forms, like in the initial slide for this section, I think it's uh, Julia Cameron is the photographer. She did a lot of photographs of her own children and her friend's children in various uh, states of costume and undress kind of on spiritual or biblical or historical themes. But there's also kind of a more, a more direct positioning of children as paradoxically innocent and seductive in photography from this time. I do want to talk a little bit about the vocabulary that in contemporary sources, kind of 19th century sources, is used to describe uh, what we'd now call sexual abuse. Uh, the term sexual abuse itself was coined kind of in uh, 1864 in a medical context, which is certainly where a lot of the language that is used kind of circulates through that medical, uh, medical corpus of texts, but it was not kind of the first and foremost, or the most unambiguous language we use, which I mean, we don't have necessarily unambiguous language today. There's certainly a vocabulary of both euphemism and kind of technical jargon that uh, distances one somewhat from the subject matter at hand uh, while evoking different aspects of it. But for the Victorians, the aspects that, uh, especially people in a position of authority or responsibility for children, people who consider themselves to be kind of the moral defenders of children, uh, they really evoked uh, both kind of the unspeakableness of uh, kind of uh, sexual crimes against children in terms of something that they they would hope that, you know, ordinarily pe ordinary people don't want to hear about, that's unmentionable, that's too much to relate, uh, that's indecent just to think about. Uh, but also something that's immoral, something that is a grave evil in itself and something that corrupts the morals of the child uh, rather than the morals of the adult, which are already assumed to be depraved. Uh, but it's also kind of framed in terms of what's unthinkable, uh, that this is something that even kind of moral reformers who are seeking to promote kind of the well-being of uh, children in abuse situations or kind of unawareness of this particular type of child harm uh, they really very much frame this as, you know, this is something you'd never think was happening, uh, which is not necessarily, which is a tricky concept kind of in, in, the, in the treatment of uh, sexual assault as a phenomenon. That's not necessarily uh, the way that you might want to frame that now. How did 19th century readers conceptualize sexual abuse? Like what were their uh, kind of key points in their understanding? A uh, big one that I want to talk about here is the element of class and kind of the public public acknowledgement, particularly in the press and in the courts of uh, child sexual abuse as a phenomenon. Uh, for the most part, kind of the cases where we have of 
uh, attempted prosecutions or successful prosecutions of kind of sexual harm against children in this time period are all pursued within uh, working class families by and large. Uh, so we kind of, it may be kind of the, the only encounter that many kind of poor families had with their, their law enforcement system around them, or it might've been one of many, uh, but it is very much an aspect where uh, people were people were taking recourse in the apparatus of law that was now kind of available to them uh, by whatever means that they could. There's a very, uh, there's a great kind of body of work on this subject of uh, child sexual abuse in the 19th century and beyond by Louise A. Jackson. And she has a lot of accounts that include, uh, you know, pretty communal responses to uh, sex crimes against children in the community by these working class communities, uh, which in some ways is very inspiring and in some ways suggests the absolute lack of infrastructure and protections for children uh, in the position of uh, kind of alleged assault in this era. Uh, there's also kind of the idea of the uh, sexual predator as kind of a public health hazard. Uh, it's kind of the idea of the park pest, somebody who's out there bothering uh, another euphemism, out there kind of harassing people as they're trying to uh, take their uh, take their leisure time in public spaces like the public park, in particular children who were kind of left in many cases uh, unattended while, they're, while their parents may be working. Uh, there's also a gender dynamic where women are positioned as uh, the most likely witnesses in many cases of the kind of the physiological uh, symptoms and kind of evidences of abuse but they are also in many ways the least equipped to kind of report and give it legally testify to what they have witnessed in many cases, particularly where the perpetrator may be the head of the household, maybe their own husband. So there is kind of a collective response where women really uh, connect with one another and kind of construct a, a fictitious, uh, a kind of a fictitious premise that another person is the one who witnessed, per, for instance, uh, an attack or the aftermath of an attack or witnessed uh, kind of these symptoms of a child's illness after abuse uh, so that the mother is not forced to kind of uh, testify against her own husband or be refused the ability to testify against her own husband. And very much kind of the, the tone overall in public uh, print acknowledgement of child sexual abuse is very much skewed toward uh, the premise of the exploitation of children of the working classes by uh, men of the ruling classes, uh, which understandably in, evokes a very strong kind of uh, political sentiment from below during this time period. There's a ton of protests, which I was honestly not expecting uh, in the aftermath of the publication of uh, W.T. Stead's uh, um, ma uh, Maiden Tribute of Modern Babylon, where he gives this kind of multi-part expose account of how easy it is to purchase a child for sexual purposes in, in the London of his contemporaries. It is very, uh, it is a text that is worth kind of interrogating and looking deeper into than the narrative it presents. It is certainly kind of a, a text that is a product rather than uh, an unalloyed account of real events, but it really, really kind of struck a nerve and it was being discussed in a very public manner that very much informed uh, kind of the next few decades of how people discussed. This was in 1885. Uh, it was very much in circulation over the next few decades in terms of how people understood uh, kind of adult child sexual encounters and the intentions of adults towards children. Uh, there's also kind of a uh, a weird overlap during this time period in uh, sodomy prosecutions, where because there is not the idea of a of a boy in this era having necessarily a virginity to lose, uh, sexual assaults are kind of prosecuted and pursued in terms of uh, kind of the the broader umbrella of sodomy cases. So we get uh, you know cases of consensual encounters or kind of arguably consensual encounters between adults being lumped in with what we would now recognize as very uh, unfortunately recognizable uh, abuse scenarios, like uh, kind of youth, youth community organizers uh, having sex with children or uh, teachers sexually abusing their charges. Those are all kind of lumped under the sodomy heading uh, because the victims happen to be boys. And it's a definitely a disservice to everybody else who's under that heading, frankly, but it is also something that scholars working in kind of the history of sexuality in this time period uh, 
find is a little bit of a minefield in particular, uh, most recently in terms of how people use court uh, courtroom kind of data. Uh, this was a little little bit of a tripping tripping up point for Naomi Wolf in her book Outrages, kind of the conscious misrepresentation of a case that involved children as if it were a case involving teenagers or adults. Uh, kind of here in this same kind of cradle of developing uh, understanding, there's a ton of uh, generally in kind of sexology and psychology research during this time period, there's a lot of case studies that uncover kind of accounts of uh, either kind of, you know, agent, what we would now consider to be age inappropriate sexual contact, whether that was something that the, the person reporting experienced as troubling or not. Uh, but there's also kind of the idea of people reporting their own attraction to children in these case studies as kind of this, this body of account data is being uh, compiled. There's kind of a developing understanding at this time, particularly in Europe with Freud and the gang, of kind of sexual neuroses is having a sexual origin, kind of this aspect of mental illness that is related to uh, sexuality and in some cases, sexual trauma. At this point, kind of in the mid 1890s, Freud has actually not walked back. Uh, his kind of, uh, he's at a point where he is receiving in his uh, kind of clinical work, many accounts of either uh, sexual abuse or sexual assault kind of within upper class families in his own Vienna and kind of beyond. And that is something that he cannot square with this previous very class bound understanding of uh, sexual abuse as kind of a, a consequence of the working class having poor morals and not very good boundaries within the family. So he, at this point, he is not yet kind of walked back the belief that this is something that potentially, like he found that very troubling, but he's not yet at a point where he believes that it is something that can only be accounted for by, by fantasies of sexual ex exploitation. Uh, at this point, he's very much uh, trying to deal with that in the way that it's been relayed to him. And it's kind of in the, the germ of how we understand uh, kind of sexual repression and sexual desire uh, in Freud. Now we're gonna talk about something way happier, which is dead people. Um, I'm gonna talk about ghosts and hauntings. Uh, this kind of, this spirit photography featured, I found this fascinating, both in terms of kind of the, the visuality of how uh, spirit photographs evoke the presence of kind of otherworldly forces or the spirits of the dead, uh, but also the, the very reasonable to me connection uh, with parents grieving their children and kind of the idea of child mortality in this era as a spur of kind of uh, ghost, uh, ghostly desires and ghostly desired ghostly encounters. Uh, in terms of psychical research, uh, which is very much kind of a, a camp apart from spiritualism as kind of a means by which people pursue those spiritual encounters, it very much arises from this predominantly male culture of swapping ghost accounts and swapping ghost stories in your ghost clubs. Ghost clubs, I want to say they arise in many cases out of universities during this time period, which are a very male dominated space. Uh, and they very much have kind of a different, uh, almost the polar opposite kind of gendered atmosphere atmosphere from the rel relative uh, uh, prominence of women in spiritualism during the 19th century. Uh, there's a Society for Psychical Research in Britain at this time is really kind of building its membership. Uh, it's one of kind of several societies, certainly not the only one, but it boasts kind of William James among its members. And we know that uh, Henry James at the very least visited a number of times and he often kind of presented as a guest lecturer on his brother, guest lecturer, pardon me, on his brother's behalf. Uh, many of these accounts kind of include elements that you will encounter in Turn of the Screw. Some of those may be because they're more broadly disseminated into what Western European people think of when they think of ghosts, uh, but they may also kind of have been a more directly metabolized into the narrative we're given uh, by Henry James, kind of with a real purpose to contrive a haunting that in many ways looks like uh, the kind of visual hauntings we get in uh, kind of contemporary, quote unquote, real ghost accounts, whatever that may mean. At the same time, kind of in cycle research, there's also kind of a link to trauma, both the obvious trauma of grief and bereavement, uh, which is pretty central to uh, certainly the 19th century experience of uh, kind of spectral phenomena and kind of connections with uh, the idea of the immortal soul. 
uh, but there's also kind of an element of sexuality, sexual development, and in some cases kind of uh, sexual trauma, in particular kind of during the formative uh, young adolescence or late childhood of uh, child subjects. Uh, and this is something that kind of gets a bigger amount of mileage in the early 20th century, I would say, kind of culminating in the contemporary uh, kind of contemporary 21st century truisms that poltergeists afflict young girls who are first going through puberty, or uh, I think it's, is it monarchy, kind of the, my mind always wants to say, mm, monarch, and it's like, no, it may be monarchy, kind of the first, uh, the first period experience uh, when children are undergoing that, that is kind of a spur uh, for spiritual trouble, which has a lot packed into it that I won't get into here, uh, but at the same time, there's very much children, sexuality, gender, ghosts. There's a lot going on there in terms of kind of, those are themes that appear uh, in kind of cycle research of the 19th and early 20th century to have a real affinity for one another at the same time as the inquirers are uh, generally adult men. All right, kind of, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about why ghosts and trauma are a good fit for one another. Uh, which they manifestly seem to be uh, in terms of how they are connected uh, in a great deal of kind of ghost, ghost, ghost media, ghost fiction, and kind of the way that the idea of the ghost is used kind of as a, a byword for a holdover experience in kind of uh, casual speech. Uh, the idea both of kind of haunting and of being haunted uh, really kind of gives a duality to uh, the, the violent act and the person who is acted upon in a 19th century context. There's certainly a, the prevalence of ghost accounts in some really fun 19th century true crime accounts uh, certainly makes me think that people were at least capable of seeing at the time the idea of a ghost returning uh, to vindicate itself as kind of a, a revenge against the guilty conscience of the perpetrator. Uh, but there's also kind of for the person, uh, the person who themselves is foregrounded is experiencing this haunting. It can kind of be used in a narrative sense as a very kind of literal way to convey the idea of uh, past experiences kind of overshadowing current experiences of kind of intrusive memories uh, spilling over into the present day, often in uh, distressing ways, or as kind of uh, a way of representing the idea of being thrust uh, either kind of uh, being the individual being thrust back in time or the event from uh, previous time being thrust forward into the contemporary understanding uh, in a way that causes at the very least kind of disturbance, but in many cases distress. Uh, in terms of depictions of ghosts on film, uh, ghosts get a lot of mileage in kind of the Gothic mode uh, for kind of depicting the afterlife of historical uh, kind of atrocities or misdeeds, this kind of uh, rising up of what has previously been suppressed through the form of ghosts, kind of something that cannot be uh, cannot be banished until it's acknowledged. Uh, my two examples here are the 2020 film, The Power, uh, which is a period piece set in 1970s Britain, uh, dealing with the kind of, uh, I guess uh, the gendered suppression of uh, sexual violence is a reality in mid-century Britain, but also kind of uh, the the murders of children in the course of that story, kind of harm against uh, harm against children is something that needs an adult witness to uh, kind of bring it to bring it to a useful conclusion. But also uh, Guillermo del Toro's the devil the, the devil's backbone, which very much uses uh, kind of the idea of ghosts and child ghosts in particular as kind of a, a means to explore historical traumas that may have been kind of uh, built over or buried under by kind of the dominant regime or kind of the dominant mode. Um, I'll talk a little bit about creepy kids, kind of what makes kids so creepy. And that is kind of the, the impetus beyond, behind the name of the novel, the idea that if one child in a ghost story uh, is creepy enough, then two children provides another turn of the screw. Um, in the context of kind of the, the framing device of the novel, I won't say that it's necessarily that children themselves are creepy, but more that they lead themselves to a creepy environment. 
but it's certainly an adaptation. These kids are creepy. We can say that these comfortably are creepy children. Uh, there's kind of an, an off-putting uh, incompatibility between their physical vulnerability and kind of the, the potential that they may have malicious intentions. Uh, kind of the the uncanniness of a little person who walks, you know, dresses like perhaps like an adult, but not quite talks, perhaps like an adult, but not quite. Uh, but there's also kind of the aspect of uh, children having a very unselfconsciously, in many cases, kind of morbid interest, both a curiosity about death and kind of a an inability to process and what we would consider to be an adult fashion uh, the reality of something like something like violence or something that's a little bit uh, on the macabre side. Um, as a former uh, child who loved creepy things, that's now an adult who loves creepy things. For me, that's certainly a feature and not a bug. Uh, but there's also the element that. Uh, even that kind of uh, morbidity is in itself ambiguous, that there's the hesitance to attribute malice to what might be better explained in terms of children being weird, children loving to say weird stuff for no particular reason, kind of due to either the innocence of their minds or the, the weirdness of the developmental stage that they're at, and that that's something that people have more or less tolerance for uh, and are not necessarily uh, prime, prime to jump on just yet is necessarily a sign of malice. I wanna say that it's in, I wanna say it's that, it's either the 1960s or the early 1970s. There's a horror film with creepy children called Who Can Kill a Child? And that is, uh, as a question-based title, really great, but I think it also kind of gets at uh, the central element of why children are unsettling to many adult viewers, the idea that even if they have ill intentions toward you, what can you do about it? Like they're, they're little enough that you'd feel bad uh, kind of fending them off with as much force you'd say for an adult assailant. It's also the idea of the knowledge of evil, kind of do children, when they say things that are macabre or kind of inappropriate, perhaps precocious, are they indicating in actuality an adult knowledge of right and wrong? Or are they kind of mimicking or parroting adults who speak from that position of, you know, understanding uh, and kind of discernment between what is right and what is wrong? The idea that children lack this is certainly not kind of new. There's very much a construct throughout, uh, throughout kind of the Middle Ages and early modern period in Western Europe, the idea of it being really important to discern uh, when children can, uh, you know, when children can be said to have committed a crime, uh, when they can be held legally culpable for their actions, when they can commit to something like a life of uh, monastic uh, commitment, or, you know, when, when are they capable of understanding enough to sign a contract or to consent to sex? And those are kind of numbers and figures that really rise and fall over the course of those centuries, uh, but they all kind of tie back to the idea of knowledge and that kind of a certain amount of knowledge and experience turns one from a child who is innocent into an adult who is knowing. Uh, the governess in particular in Turn of the Screw is very concerned about what the children have seen, not necessarily just what they've heard, but what they have seen kind of with, uh, with their eyes, which for me suggests on one level, the possibility that they have witnessed kind of adult goings on between adults as, a, as an element of kind of fearfulness and an unsettling kind of age inappropriate encounter, but also just the idea that uh, she doesn't know what they've seen in the past. She wasn't there for it and that she's only relying on kind of secondhand accounts like grosses uh, to give her an impression of uh, who these figures were like when they were alive and kind of what they're, say what they're saying and doing with the children uh, now that they're dead. Uh, there's kind of this double-edged sword where innocence can mean guiltlessness, but it can also mean kind of ignorance of evil and you know can a child be innocent of the innocent of wrongdoing uh, but at the same time have done something wrong like can they not understand what they're doing necessarily uh, but there's also kind of the very big fear in the governess's mind of the idea of kind of sham innocence uh, that these children know enough to know that they should dissemble uh, from her and that they should conceal what they know and what is really potentially on their minds uh, from her for the sake of hoodwinking her or putting one over on her. She's very uh, aware of the fact that children play tricks and she's very troubled by the idea that some of the tricks that the children are pulling may have a more adult 
uh, adult level of malevolency behind them or adult level of calculation. Um, there's also the idea of adult language, which in kind of a courtroom context or in the course of a prosecution of any kind of uh, sexual conduct surrounding a child, uh, there's a very strong scrutiny in this time period on all levels of the court of the language that a child uses to articulate their experiences or to describe their own body or the bodies of others. And this is uh, very much a case where the only correct answer that would reflect uh, on a child's uh, innocence of sexuality and innocence of kind of adult uh, adult ill intentions, but at the same time, uh, ability to correctly indicate one way or another that something has happened. The only right answer is no answer at all to kind of gesture and hang your head, uh, which is something that the governess in the case of trying to kind of extort acknowledgement from the children, that is kind of the most that she gets, kind of this uh, ambiguous acknowledgement that is too almost too bashful to convey what she really needs to know. Uh, but there's also in the case of turn of the screw, the idea of adult language in the case of cussing, <laughs> where uh, at one point, you know, when Flora is kind of uh, shocked almost into hysterics by the governess's kind of uh, pursuit of her and her uh, relentless inquiries, uh, Flora uh, begins to use what were described as kind of appalling language, uh, kind of she's uh, insulting the governess, insulting Ms. Gross, you know, saying that uh, the governess is hurting her and saying that she misses Miss Chassel, kind of this uh, idea of children knowing language that people don't customarily use in front of children, uh, very much treated as a more troubling event than it might be to a modern viewer, where the idea of a child learning a swear word is not, not a sign of severe moral damage to that child, but potentially a cause for like laughter. Uh, but for the governess, it's really troubling because it turns Flora from this doll-like little woman into an old woman, kind of the idea of her being old and hard and cruel and decrepit because she's capable of uh, resisting uh, the very passive model that's been imposed on her as a little girl and by using language that is unsuitable for a young lady, not just a young woman, uh, but for a young lady of her class. Uh, she's also attributed this weird amount of adult adult agency to do things that children can't do because their bodies are weak, uh, like rowing a boat across a lake by herself. Um, and it's Hachimachi, sorry, I accidentally uh, blew up the chat again, too distracted by people talking about stranger danger. Uh, but that's another aspect of kind of attributing to her an adult agency as something that is troubling rather than something that may come from her kind of I guess, you know, spreading, spreading her wings in terms of her, her own abilities and kind of doing more than the adults around her expect her as particularly a girl to do. Kind of talking about some of the central characters in this case, I'm going to try and expedite this, but uh, kind of the governess is kind of this figure of inquiry. Uh, there's the idea that she may be seeking out what she wishes to see for whatever reason, either that she's projecting what she dreads the most onto these children or that she herself has a kind of dirty mind that she's inclined to see, uh, you know, bad intentions and, and maliciousness and potentially sexuality where none necessarily exists. Uh, the idea of kind of her being relatively morally unimpeachable. She, she's young and she's naive, but at the same time, she takes her responsibilities very seriously. And she kind of uh, embodies a kind of uh, feminine Christian morality uh, that her era uh, would prefer to see uh, women, of her, women of her social standing kind of manifest. At the same time, her home life back home does not appear to be going well. And there's very much the sense that she may be attaching herself so passionately to her charges, not simply because her charges are so incredibly beautiful and lovable, but because her own home life is disappointing and because she's kind of this young unmarried woman who perhaps uh, would prefer to position herself as a mother rather than just kind of a, a one of a string of disposable teachers. Uh, but there's also the idea of the governess is kind of fulfilling this uh, Freudian fantasy of supplanting the mother and taking the father's affections, or also the idea of the governess as kind of, uh, in many ways, uh, her love of children being cast in an erotic light, whatever, however one interprets that, whether that is kind of in an overtly negative light or being understood as kind of an aspect of her, her repression and dysfunction. Uh, there's kind of the the, the specter of the fact that she she herself may have uh, have the bad intentions for these children that she attributes to to Quint in particular and also to Jessel. Uh, there's kind of a climactic 
the, the climactic confrontation where people cannot seem to resist the urge and adaptation to cram in uh, special effects or ghostly voiceovers, uh, where the governess kind of confronts Miles about his connection to Quint, uh, in many ways reads to me like kind of a parody of trauma disclosure, where the individual who's experienced, uh, you know, harassment or assault uh, obligingly produces all the details of uh, their experience that their hearers want to hear and none of the ones that their hearers don't want to hear. It's very much uh, uncomfortably placed in the in the zone of, of expectations and kind of uh, inquiries that demand a response rather than kind of the free disclosure uh, being met with support or with uh, even kind of you know moral outrage that might occur. It's very much being dragged out of miles and the governess is more than willing to do that. Because uh, she has a little bit of a problem with leading questions. Some adaptations bring this to the fore. Like I believe in The Innocence, there's this chain of suggestive questions between the governess and Gross that really seem to plant in the governess's mind the idea that the man that she saw was Quint. But at the same time, there's this there's this threat that if she acknowledges to the children too directly, she may plant ideas in their mind. But if she acknowledges uh, kind of the events that she's concerned about too obliquely, the children won't understand uh, what she wants them to do, which is kind of to tell them uh, whatever she's concerned about. Also kind of want to uh, touch on the ways that the government, the governess is very concerned with kind of who has ultimate possession of Miles. Uh, she uses the language of having Miles relatively frequently, uh, which is, kind of weird, uh, but it also seems to be kind of setting up this pitched battle between herself and kind of the male negative moral influence of Quint, uh, where Miles himself is kind of the battleground. And there's a question of who will ultimately uh, kind of take him, which is both, you know, sexually charged in the way that that kind of battleground metaphor is, but it is also kind of a sign that she, a sign that she views herself as kind of engaging in a form of moral combat against her predecessors who are too far away for her to reach. Uh, Mrs. Gross is kind of the uh, the helpful backstory establishing figure in this story. Uh, she's very much an ally to Ms., uh, to uh, the governess figure, uh, who does occasionally get names and adaptations. I just skip them entirely. Uh, but at the same time, the very fact that she witnessed what uh, previously took place among uh, the governess's predecessors uh, makes her a very troubling figure in her own right. The idea that she did not intervene to protect the children uh, in some ways she seems as if she's being positioned uh, by the governess as if that is in some ways excusable because after all she's only a st stout simple plain clean woman she's not of she's not from the same moral uh kind of morally refined background as the the governess herself is uh but at the same time she has very good reasons to have not intervened in this case. She's kind of in this painful bind between being fully aware that her, her employer does not wish to be bothered by anything, let alone kind of complaints about the behavior of one of his own employees. Uh, but she's also afraid of direct retaliation from Quint, who is kind of as a, as a favorite of the uncle figures, he's kind of in a position of power over all the women in the household, as well as kind of the very direct form of power uh, derived not from kind of class or status, but from uh, his his privileged position as a man in this uh, 19th century context. Uh, but she is, for the most part in the story, positioned as if she is kind of beneath Quint's own sexual notice, but that is something that is not always the case in adaptation. I'll get to that later. Uh, Jessel herself is kind of the previous governess. Uh, she's positioned in many ways as kind of a parallel, both to the governess herself and to Flora, upon whom she has kind of positioned her claim. If Quint wishes to have Miles, uh, Jessel wishes to have Flora, uh, either for her own child or for some other purposes. Kind of the idea that she herself may also have this repressed and stifled, misdirected wish to start a family, you know, like all women do. Um, but her relationship with Quint is also characterized as in its own fashion, uh, a very much a strong class transgression. She herself may be in a similar position as to a servant, kind of as a governess. She's not in kind of a prestige position in the household, but she is still kind of understood by the governess and by Gross as being too good to mess with a guy like Quint. Uh, and that kind of is her, almost her, her ultimate damnation, kind of the idea that she has 
uh, broken, uh, kind of broken the class barrier between them that differentiates some servants from other servants and kind of determines that some are better and some are worse. She's also kind of in this bridge position between, between the children and Quint where she is more powerful and more physically strong than the children, but she's uh, certainly less powerful than Quint and seems to be positioned as physically vulnerable to him. Uh, but she's also kind of in this position where the governess has no sympathy for her. Uh, and that can be understood as either because she sees her as in her own right, kind of an, an actor in the mistreatment of her charges, or as kind of having, having failed her moral duty and kind of vacated her post uh, by being charmed by Quint instead of uh, by rigorously morally defending herself and her charges against his influence. Um, ooh. I can't wait to get to that question, Gail. I'm so sorry. I need to I need to stay out of the, the chat for now, but it's so good. Um, we get to Quint himself, who is so bad and so sexy. He is positioned in a very specific niche of male attractiveness, which is to say that he is attractive in a cheap kind of way. He looks like an actor and he has red hair, which is closely curling, which some of me wants to interpret as a weird uh, anti-Irish thing. That's certainly something that adaptations have run with, with the idea of him as either Irish or in another way kind of regionally marked as different from uh, the rest of the household at Bly, kind of inappropriate on that level. Uh, he's kind of described in terms of uh, very, very predatory animalistic terms. Uh, Gro uh, Gross calls him a hound, uh, by which she clearly means both like like when you call a guy a tomcat, like he's really uh, kind of uh, sexually omnivorous, but also the sense that he is uh, coarse and potentially violent. His wickedness is described in kind of very general terms, uh, but also very suggestive terms. We get the language that he's too free, that he takes improper liberties uh, with people, as well as with uh, his master's property. Uh, there's a theme throughout where uh, Quint is spotted as a specter wearing his master's clothes. Uh, he is wearing kind of the master of the house's clothes. And even if they they fit him decently well, the governess just looking at him can tell those aren't his clothes. He's not, he's not suited to wear those clothes. Those are a gentleman's clothes and he's only a servant. Uh, and that's kind of a an additional, I guess for me, kind of also in itself, strangely sexual transgression of the, the boundaries of the home uh, and the boundaries between masters and servants. Uh, in the 19th century, there's very much this idea of uh, servants as kind of a, 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 a threat to the moral and sexual integrity of the household, that a bad servant can really do a lot of damage, not just to the property of the household, which is also kind of a reasonable concern, the idea that Quint is stealing, uh, but also to kind of the moral fiber of the household. Uh, there's this theme in, again, kind of Freud's uh, late 19th century, kind of 1890s writing about hysteria, uh, where he does point to the fact that uh, many of his patients who present with what he considers to be hysteria have had these experiences of kind of age inappropriate sexual contact with servants, uh, though he indicates primarily female servants due to his kind of presuppositions about childcare during the era, uh, which is in its, in its own right says a lot to me about how, how Freud uh, imagined the, the division of household labor in the 19th century. Uh, at the same time, kind of servants are these symbols of class status. They're the idea that you have not just one, not just two, but this whole household of kind of domestic employees. Uh, but at the same time, they are bringing in kind of lower class individuals into your home. And the idea of a servant who is superficially charming, but kind of inwardly corrupt, uh, really kind of rustles uh, the, the middle class Victorian audience in a way that turns up in both uh, kind of the the psychological case studies, often in sexology, but also in pornography, the idea that uh, the protagonist might reasonably be sexually initiated, not by a person of their own class with or, within, with or without the confines of the family, but by a servant, by kind of a, a butler or a maid. That is a very common element in kind of the sexual landscape of 19th century pornography, among kind of uh, a very free for all attitude toward uh, sexuality. I want to talk relatively briefly about Miles and Flora, because they are, you know, though they are so central to this narrative, they are also very much viewed through the governess's lens uh, in initially as very, like, 
straight up angelic. She interprets, she describes them as kind of, you know, being cherubic, angelic, too good, uh, you know, not having anything to whack, the idea of them just being too, uh, too good to imagine them doing anything wrong because they're so beautiful. Uh, but also uh, later on, she's, she pivots to attributing them uh, a great deal of malice and a great deal of uh, premeditation and calculation in withholding from her the information that she uh, wishes to see. Uh, neither of them is particularly forthcoming about their experiences. They don't seem to be in a rush to uh, tell the governess or to disclose to the governess what they may have experienced. Uh, but the governess considers that to be in itself not a sign that she should build her trust with the children or that uh, perhaps they simply don't consider it to be notable enough to share, uh, but she finds it morally suspicious as she her kind of suspicions mount. She begins to feel that the children are uh, consciously concealing something from her and that when they are talking amongst themselves, uh, they are talking behind her back. Uh, and that idea of kind of talk, kind of impertinent talk between children uh, ties in for me with the uh, kind of possible explanations for Miles's expulsion to sc from school. His kind of account of uh, his own reasons for expulsion are very much framed in terms of language. He talks about uh, saying things and the things that he says being objectionable, but what he says is not specified, uh, only that he shares it with other boys, which kind of gives, gives to many readers the implication of some kind of sexual talk or age inappropriate discussion of sexuality, if not kind of uh, sexual overtures themselves. Um, and for a frustrating period of the 20th century, kind of the critical response to that is very much, well, it must have been nothing of significance, because we all know that the Victorians were hysterical prudes, so it couldn't have been anything, could have been anything really bad, uh, but there is kind of a, a way of understanding during this time period of, of school sexuality as a legitimate site of moral danger, even if it's not necessarily the moral danger uh, that a contemporary audience might ascribe to that kind of contact. Uh, whereas kind of, as opposed to kind of Miles's reticence, uh, when Flora is drilled about kind of her, her possible encounters with Miss Jessel's ghost, she really kind of flips the script and becomes a difficult child. She becomes uh, disobedient and non-compliant and her whole physical presence uh, very much does a 180 from the, the governess's initial descriptions of her as angelic and perfect and innocent and doll-like and pink-cheeked to the idea of her being hard and vulgarly pert. Uh, she's kind of been debased and turned in from, a, from an adorable child into kind of a loathsome woman. At one point, she's described as being an old, old woman, kind of having not just more knowledge than a child should, but kind of the, the repulsive knowledge of someone who's lived a long and wicked life. Kind of a side note about sexuality in Victorian public schools, because I really have a bee in my bonnet about people assuming that Miles, that sexuality could not be part of what Miles did. Um, we don't really get a sense again, you know, of what it is necessarily that he said, simply that it's it's unacceptable for the school context, that it seems to have been overheard, and that it's not, uh, it's been deemed inappropriate by kind of the, the powers that be in the school context, kind of the adult uh, the adult administrators and teachers who may have may have uh, had this come to light. Uh, there's kind of a theme of uh, kind of throughout the novel, the idea of moral contamination, that kind of wickedness is contagious and then can be spread from one person to another. Uh, and the idea that Miles has been kind of transmitting, transmitting uh, a sexual knowledge that adults would rather he did not possess, whether or not it's sexual knowledge that is in itself inappropriate uh, is very much kind of on on, on people's minds here, the idea that uh, schools are this schools are this area where children's children's moral fiber can really be made or destroyed by the company that they keep and the knowledge they have of sexuality. Victorians certainly seem to have been aware uh, that kind of you know sexual sexual conduct takes place in schools, and I will be I should have said this up top. This is a section where I will be talking about primarily sexual contact between children of the same age or children kind of uh, of school age. I hopefully won't be going too, too far into detail, but also kind of topics that are not kind of trying to find a better phrasing for this than solo sexuality, kind of uh, sexual exploration, stuff like masturbation and kind of the Victorian era is also constructed as being part of this uh, environment of sexual peril that one might encounter in a school setting. Uh, adults, particularly adult men who'd been to public schools, kind of so adult men of a certain social class certainly seem to have 
uh, recalled what their, their own school experiences entailed. There were periodically kind of scandals about uh, the degree to which immorality kind of flourished in these environments, but also kind of school administrators and medical authorities were very concerned about uh, the idea that sexual knowledge might be transmitted in a school context and kind of damage their, damage their pupils' moral fiber. Uh, this kind of locates uh, sexual, sexual education and kind of any knowledge of sexuality firmly in kind of the idea of the null curriculum, the group of things that are conspicuously not taught in a particular edu educational institution. Uh, the idea of, you know, if you tell them anything, even very, very restrained, measured, veiled language, uh, you will suggest sexuality to children and you'll make them think about it. Whatever you do, don't have them think about it. So don't give them the language. Don't even mention that it exists. Uh, just scare the bejesus out of them and they won't ever encounter it. Uh, seems to have been kind of the governing, the governing principle for many, many people who consider themselves to be authorities on kind of school sexual hygiene. Uh, the idea of kind of that candor about sexuality or even kind of uh, vagueness by modern standards as being a site of danger is really, uh, really at the core of uh, however we might interpret for me, uh, Miles's kind of uh, dialogue at school, whatever there is that, that, that caused that problem, no matter how innocent or severe we may take it to be, it's certainly the idea that any sexuality at all, any knowledge of that whatsoever, or even the language uh, associated with the body was excessive knowledge for a child. Uh, kind of puts the, put the, puts those stakes uh, into perspective for me. Uh, this is also an area where um, adaptations really do not like the idea of Miles's school transgression being sexual and not violent. It seems to be a real era of perhaps understandable discomfort. Um, in terms of why in this time period uh, sexual abuse is difficult to acknowledge, I think the major thing, especially in terms of institutional situations, like for example, if uh, if we're meant to take uh, Quint as kind of a, a male authority in the household, kind of a, an arm of uh, the master of the house, the uncle figure, or the uncle figure himself as potentially kind of a, a sexual threat, uh, the idea that that the idea that somebody is uh, challenging kind of the authority of these august male-led institutions uh, caused a great deal of discomfort. There's also the idea of uh, you know, violating those taboos of sexual, around sexual frankness, the idea of acknowledging sexuality uh, being in itself kind of inappropriate and unwholesome for a person of any age to address candidly, uh, but also the idea of challenging and kind of contravening uh, conventional knowledge around sexual assault, that it doesn't happen to certain kinds of people, that it only happens to some, and kind of the way that it takes place uh, very much does not these notions, especially in the 19th century, do not uh, map well to the reality of sexual assaults as they are reported, even in a courtroom context, which of course represents only a, only a slice of what happened in reality, but also the prospect of children testifying against adults and women testifying against men was very disquieting. And in, in the case of the turn of the screw, I think all of those factors are in play, uh, both the, the dangers built into the hierarchy of the household and the dangers of kind of men and women in proximity or men kind of with uncontrolled access uh, to women and, and to children. Because the governess's initial thought first seeing Quint kind of on the battlements is not that he's there for her, but explicitly that he has come for miles. And whether we're meant to understand that as having kind of a, a sexual connotation or not, it certainly has the connotation that due to his kind of status as a very, uh, insubordinate and freewheeling uh, man, uh, Quint is more dangerous uh, than he might be if he were if he were a woman or if he were even a gentleman, he would have presumably more skin in the game of pretending to be decorous. Uh, all of this kind of feeds into feeds into my interest in kind of the treatment of gender in the Gothic, but also the theme of kind of uh, decay and danger, the idea of the home as a perilous place or perhaps not the governess's home. She never really comes to see Bly as her own residence, uh, but kind of the, the idea of danger is kind of littering this Gothic playground of a, of a residence that are not necessarily uh, ghosts in suits of armor. Finally, I'm gonna to get to film here, but kind of the keystone elements of how this is reflected for me, big ones are, you know, how is Quint reflected on film? Like, is he depicted as sexy, as seductive, 
as good looking but violent or is he depicted as kind of ugly and weird like is he how is his appeal or lack thereof to women depicted uh, and kind of how is Gestel's response to him depicted is it depicted in terms of coercion or in terms of seduction uh, kind of how, to what degree kind of sexual abuse and childhood trauma are named on screen or shown to any degree uh, but also kind of the, the treatment of you know why did Miles get down, sent down from school? Why is, why is Flora in hysterics uh, upon confrontation? Uh, and kind of the, the sense of, you know, what have, they, what have the children seen of Quentin Jessel? Those are all elements uh, that ride very, uh, ride very centrally on kind of the, the trauma reading of how I read these various film adaptations. All right. So right, if I kind of turn over for, All right, now I'm finally getting around to the transition to film. Uh, this is kind of an adaptation where, though ma many kind of other Gothic stories, including Gothic stories around governesses like Jane Eyre, uh, got a lot of traction from the very early days of cinema technology. Like there's something like, there's like a dozen kind of uh, black and white era adaptations of Jane Eyre, including a silence for whatever reason. There's, there's a big proliferation of kind of Gothic Gothic fiction in kind of early film, uh, Turn of the Screw kind of gets, um, it gets one radio play adaptation in the 1940s, which I love. You can find that online and I should probably link to it. Uh, but for the most part, it kind of gets its revival in the teleplay era and kind of this idea of broadcasting films on television or even live plays. Uh, but due to kind of technological limitations of that time, uh, none of those teleplays are available to be rewatched by modern viewers, even kind of ones that sound really tantalizing. Uh, like there's one with one where the, the, the text is written by Gore Vidal, or there's one where uh, Ingrid Bergman plays the governess, or these kind of lost texts due to the limitation of kind of film, uh, film retention uh, from television in those eras. Uh, we also get... Uh, in 1961, we get a pivot to kind of uh, cinema treatment of the, uh, the turn of the screw with Jack Clayton's The Innocents. But I do think it is worth noting uh, that for all this film's kind of aesthetic gloss, uh, the kinds of haunting depiction in it, depicted in it, already felt kind of well-tread to the average film goer in 1961. Many people's responses to this film was, well, I've seen all these kinds of ghosts before. They were not particularly uh, shocked anymore by the, the way in which these ghosts operated. Uh, the Innocence is kind of the, if people think of one adaptation of The Turn of the Screw on film, it's definitely The Innocence. Uh, it's kind of this black and white, very glossy, beautiful, uh, rich and decaying uh, kind of visual treatment of its subject matter. It uses a lot of uh, kind of contrasts between daylit scenes and nighttime scenes, which is very, still very kind of shocking and effective in the context of a traditionally shadowy kind of gothic, uh, gothic context. Uh, Jack Clayton was kind of offered this project on the condition uh, that it already came pre-packaged with Deborah Kerr as the lead, as a governess figure. Uh, she had kind of a gothic pedigree by this point in film already uh, from being in uh, Paul and Pressburger's uh, Black Narcissus. It's kind of one of the nuns in this uh, emotionally brittle, hothouse, sexually charged atmosphere, uh, but also from being in The King and I as this governess who kind of does have uh, a romantic, a, a romantic affinity for him, her employer, uh, which I think kind of cer certainly informs the way that her interactions with her boss are depicted in this version. The screenplay is kind of adapted from a Broadway play of the time period, uh, with fairly extensive rewrites involving, among others, Truman Capote. <laughs> uh, Truman Capote, kind of the the legend is, or the the the, the account I've encountered is, is that. Uh, Truman Capote kind of brings some of the, the sexual sensibilities and the Freudian sensibilities to this film, but he can't write plausibly Victorian dialogue. So they have to have somebody go back and make everything sound more old timey. Um, this again, kind of I said, this, this is kind of a prestige adaptation as far as uh, film adaptations go. It's gorgeous uh, and got a lot of, a lot of kind of uh, publicity gassing it up, uh, but kind of lay audiences did not necessarily respond to it as positively as critics have uh, kind of in the decades since. Uh, the, uh, the kind of the aesthetics of corruption and decay are really at the forefront in The Innocence, uh, which kind of sheds a, casts in kind of an odd light, the beauty of the children featured in it. There's that the child performances in this film are absolutely terrific, uh, but it definitely, 
uh, kind of casts their their aesthetic framing in the film in kind of an already ominous light, the idea that there's decay already on the horizon for them. Uh, there's kind of insects and animals in this adaptation, including again, kind of insect and animal harm. Uh, but overall, there's kind of a an intense kind of visual and uh, sensory richness that is almost at odds with uh, the very visual representation of the ghosts, except for in this one scene that we have here, uh, where Miss Jessel's teardrops physically materialize as she's weeping in the children's schoolroom. Uh, there's very much this crossover from the intangible to the very much tangible uh, that Truman Capote reportedly regretted is kind of imbalancing uh, the ambiguity of, you know, are the ghosts real? Are they not real? Uh, critical responses to this film very much reflect a certain awareness of uh, sexuality as kind of an element of it, uh, but they're very kind of all in on what exactly that sexuality or that uh, kind of inappropriate sexual element may consist of. They're very kind of ready to frame the governess herself uh, as a kind of a sexually repressed, sexually frustrated woman as she's somewhat older than kind of the governesses in the novel, which I think is kind of a, a, a dirty trick to pull on Deborah Kerr. Look, she's gorgeous and she's uh, very much kind of an uh, active active figure in this film, but simply because she's older than 30, she must be a repressed old maid uh, who's kind of repressing repressing her feelings for adult men and then projecting them onto children is, is a, a very common interpretation of her uh, complex relationship with Miles in this film. There's definitely the iconic image of uh, Miles kissing her on the mouth kind of as an adult man might kiss someone. And it's very, uh, very, very unsettling. It was also something that they had a damn, damn hard time getting past uh, film censorship. Uh, and ultimately it sounds like that Clayton really dug in his heels and dug in his heels that that element would remain uh, for the ultimate effect of the film. And ultimately people kind of yielded, uh, I suspect due to kind of the classy, the little classy veneer of the setting. But there's also kind of uh, in critical responses, it's a lot imputed to the idea of brother-sister incest between Miles and Flora, the idea that they have kind of in the absence of adult figures, they've bonded to one another in kind of an inappropriate, I guess, flowers in the attic kind of way, uh, which is not necessarily a reading that I get from this film, but it certainly is, an, is a theme that we will encounter more in later adaptations. Now I'm going to be talking about Kate Bush. <laughs> this is my aside, and this is that, uh, that image of that very unsettling kiss uh, as it is, it was put on a lobby card for this film, and they really wanted to put that out there in front of people's eyes. Uh, but that is an image that seems to have stuck with the singer Kate Bush very strongly. Uh, in 1980, she puts out this song uh, on her album Never Forever that is very clearly inspired uh, by the innocence specifically and by this moment in the innocence in particular, uh, but by kind of the gothic anguish of the governess figure. Uh, Kate Bush's kind of other songs that really deal in kind of a gothic modality, uh, which I'm, I think there's a, there was a great talk a while back about uh, the gothic and 90s music videos, and Kate Bush should have one of those of her very own, uh, but she's also uh, commented on, commented on the perception of the themes of kind of adult child sexuality in this song that her fans have kind of brought to her attention, and very much frames it in terms of uh, the governess being attracted to Quint in Miles's body rather than being attracted to Miles, which may feel like splitting hairs, uh, but is uh, uh, certainly kind of a, a defense against the alternative reading that this is essentially about her feelings for kind of the, the film's more precocious Miles. Like, is Miles full on possessed as kind of an element there? I talk a little bit about kind of the, the popular perceptions of sexual violence and of trauma by decade with these films. Uh, with the 1950s and 1960s, we're still very much in kind of Freud territory, but very much kind of a pop Freudianism that has kind of filtered into popular culture. The, the idea of talking about the unconscious mind or unconscious aggression uh, as things that people, people drop into conversation as if we all know what they mean, rather than as terms of art within psychiatry. Uh, especially kind of the idea of uh, women being sexually frustrated or sexually repressed and that causing their sexuality uh, to bubble up in odd ways. Uh, is kind of a, an appearing theme in this in this film and its uh, critical responses. This is also kind of the era in which second wave feminism is really germinating. Uh, the idea of kind of uh, the home is not necessarily a safe and happy space uh, for middle class women as housewives, or kind of the idea of you know the relationship between women work and their relationships with men is kind of this area of uh, friction for women with kind of developing feminist consciousness. 
uh, but we also have in this time period this this idea of you know the sexual offender, the sexual psychopath as being very much uh, very much someone like Quint and not, for instance, someone like the uncle. Like he is not somebody who is uh, integrated into society. He is somebody who is an outsider and therefore can be more easily you know pointed at and fended off. Which I do think is we had some talk in the chat earlier about the idea of stranger danger, and I do think that that kind of concept of the roving sexual psychopath. Uh, connects to the concept of stranger danger uh, as kind of its precursor. Uh, talking about film in the 1960s and 1970s, these are some great creepy dolls um, that are, uh, and a turtle for some reason. Turtles are very big into creepy child cinema of the 70s, uh, perhaps because they're paradoxically vulnerable. Uh, but this is from The Nightcomers in 1971. Um, uh, the Nightcomers kind of can only really be made due to uh, a really big paradigm shift happening in cinema around this time. Uh, kind of the idea of new Hollywood is already kind of on its on its way upward from the 1960s, uh, but at the same time, there's very much a diminishing of traditional cons censorship constraints about what you can and can't show on film in terms of uh, moral implications around sexuality, if not sexuality itself. Uh, and the gothic as a genre is also having its uh, very much a, a second wind in terms of uh, the, I would say, not uniquely uh, feminine, but kind of the by and large female dominated world of uh, the, the, the gothic romance and the gothic paperback. Uh, there's also kind of with the renewed interest in depicting sexuality, uh, there's a renewed interest in the sexual aspects of Turn of the Screw, which uh, are not wholly original to film in this case, but certainly kind of find a home in it. Uh, Michael Winner is the director primarily of movies like Death Wish that may be known more for their violence than for, uh, I guess, and for their treatments of sexual violence rather than for uh, their kind of gothic atmosphere. Uh, this film is a prequel kind of concerned with uh, the relationship between Quint and Jessel and the quote unquote real secret of how Quint and Jessel die. Uh, in this case, uh, Quint is played by Marlon Brando doing an Irish accent, uh, not entirely convincingly, but he is very much presented as kind of a, a louche, seductive, kind of uh, liberate, sexually liberated kind of uh, rebel against the system. He's kind of Byronic in a weird way, uh, but as far from aristocratic as you can get, he's kind of a, a, a very 20th century idea of a, of a self-made man. Uh, he has a very kind of sexually destructive and initially, frankly, sexually violent relationship with Miss Jessel, where his idea of a seduction is very much to tie her up and to force himself on her while the children are witnessing it. Uh, and the children kind of incorporate what they see of uh, Quentin Jessel's kind of developing relationship uh, into their own kind of play, resulting ultimately in uh, Pretty, uh, pretty candid kind of uh, sexual games together that Gross does not approve of, uh, and kind of in the face of you know uh, Quint being dismissed and Jessel being sent home, the children determine kind of using using kind of amoral child logic is very much how it's framed that in order to keep Quint and Jessel with them, they should kill them so that they can never leave Bly and. They do. Uh, Jessel kind of is drowned in the lake after Flora sabotages her boat and Miles kills Quint with a bow and arrow. Uh, kind of almost more so than the attribution of uh, child, child murderousness, the aspect of kind of child sexuality in this is kind of shocking. But for the most part, uh, the, the eyebrow raising aspect for me is much more kind of the, the treatment of the idea of sexual initiation, kind of turning Jessel overnight uh, from a prude into kind of a, a wanton nympho type woman, which is very 70s and very uh, misogynistic. Uh, the children are very much framed as kind of incestuously connected in this adaptation, again, kind of in a someone in a flowers in the attic, like they have no one else kind of way, but also in uh, an uneasy uh, kind of mirroring one another way. The only kind of mitigating factor there is that they are clearly played uh, by teenagers uh, verging on adults. <laughs> uh, the actress who plays Flora, Verna Harvey, is 19 years old, and it is very clear that she is 19 years old. Uh, so it kind of adds almost a surreal aspect to the idea that these are children kind of on the cusp of uh, barely any form of, of kind of physical development. Uh, at the same time, 
the treatment of sexuality with Quentin Jessel is frank enough that the British film, the British film board kind of censors uh, some of the initial uh, kind of some, some frames and shots and kind of their first sex slash sexual assault scene uh, because they are specifically because they are violent rather than because they are sexual. And it kind of, it is really pushing, pushing the boundaries even for the comparatively more liberated 1970s. 1974, we have a, a made-for-TV adaptation adapted for ABC by the showrunner of Dark Shadows, Dan Curtis. Uh, and he very much kind of has metabolized the imagery and the themes of the innocents and the nightcomers uh, into this staging. Uh, he kind of takes advantage of, again, suggestion and ambiguity to kind of circumvent what you can't necessarily show on screen on an ABC TV movie uh, by kind of there's the idea of Quint and Jessel's love affair and Jessel's feelings for Quint are conveyed by off-screen love letter reading. The governess reads their love letters and declares them disgusting. Or, you know, Miles is, uh, Miles is kind of uh, sexual awareness is depicted in the course of him writing an essay that the, the governess finds disgusting and she burns it before the audience can read it. Uh, the children in this adaptation are very much kind of concerned with I guess uh, kind of there, instead of sex games, it's more games around power and control. The idea of, you know, one person giving another person orders uh, without kind of any reciprocity. It's not like a truth or dare situation. It's much more of a master and slave game. Uh, but there is also a fairly frank kind of element of sexual play between them depicted again off screen through sound uh, that is really, uh, really unsettling and kind of really raises uh, raises many questions about kind of what what precisely they themselves have seen uh, based on what we're seeing them enact. Uh, but at the same time, the ending of it is pretty, uh, pretty cut and dry. The idea is, you know, Miles is in fact possessed by Quint. All of this stuff is in fact happening because they are possessed. That is the manner in which uh, the ghost's influence is acting on them and Miles has to die. Uh, the idea that you can't put down a ghost of a, of a, that's possessing a person unless you kill that possessed person uh, very much uh, uh, puts the na final nail in Miles' coffin. Uh, but the fact that Miles in this adaptation is more or less a teenager, he's 14, uh, very much kind of colors, uh, colors the treatment of sexuality as a theme that we're now in an era uh, where teenagerhood is kind of understood as its own discrete time of sexual development. Kind of in terms of what's happening in trauma during the 70s and 80s, um, definitely some of this is much too early for the nightcomers is much too early for this. Uh, but there's kind of a really developing kind of feminist understanding of sexual assault as an issue, kind of as an understanding that is distinct um, from kind of legal or medical treatments of this topic. Uh, at the same time, there's a really strong backlash to kind of uh, feminist activism uh, that positions uh, various forms of sexual assault as uh, kind of major issues that need to be uh, addressed more directly. Uh, and it's, at the same time, kind of under the same motivations, there's a real reevaluation of kind of the Freudian model of, you know, seduction as a fantasy, the idea that his patients and, you know, women in general who are under treatment are more likely to have fantasized uh, kind of encounters rather than having really experienced sexual abuse or incest. Uh, there's been kind of a big push in starting relatively early in the 1970s, Florence Rush uh, speaks at kind of a meeting of the New York, uh, New York Organization of Radical Feminists, gives us a uh, speech about uh, child sexual abuse as kind of a feminist concern and continues to kind of make that uh, make that a central aspect of kind of her writing about uh, fe uh, feminism and rape culture. Uh, and I think I want to say kind of on, uh, no, it's the same, it's the same coast. It's in Boston. At the same time, we have uh, Anne Walbert Burgess. And I think uh, this is killing me. It's, yes, it is Linda Little Holmstrom. I always forget the Holmstrom uh, to kind of, uh, uh, psychiatric nurse practitioners and kind of hands-on kind of uh, medical uh, medical practitioners uh, formulating the idea of rape trauma syndrome both for adults and for children as kind of a, a uh, parallel to the developing understanding of combat stress in this era uh, kind of very much understood as kind of its gendered opposite the idea you know women and children experience one but men of course only experience the other uh, which is very simplistic now but it was very much a way of uh, Increasing, increasing kind of evaluation of that as a form of trauma that needs clinical response. I promised I wouldn't be talking about Anglophone adaptations, but this one's really weird, so I'm going to slip it in really fast. Uh, this was a Spanish language adaptation 
I cannot pronounce it. And there's an actual, uh, somebody who can, there's people who can speak Spanish better than me in this room and I want to die. I'm not even going to try, uh, but it's this 1985 uh, adaptation made in Spain where the figure of the governess is gender swapped into the figure of a male tutor uh, who is kind of positioned as this uh, tormented kind of sexually anguished former priest uh, who's really uh, working out the guilt of whatever happened with these children on himself. It really foregrounds kind of a very uneasy kind of child beauty and child eroticism, which I think does get more, does get more exploration on film in the 1970s and 1980s than it has had prior, uh, but not necessarily in a way that is an unalloyed good. Uh, and in this case, I think the, the most salient aspect here for me, in addition to kind of this, the cultural specificity of its uh, adaptation to a Spanish context, was basically the way that the way that uh, gendered expectations around men and women uh, really impact the way that the eroticism uh, that the, the governess figure in this adaptation that he imputes to these children, the way that it's perceived by the viewer. All right, Ooh, now we get to go to cable, uh, kind of the opposite in terms of, you know, you got European cinema, and then we have one that aired on the Showtime network in 1989. Uh, 1989's show Nightmare Classics Showcase was an attempt to kind of do a serial of, of more gothic fiction inspired uh, horror, horror uh, made, for film, made for TV films. Uh, and this one really much is, really much, very much is kind of stretching its legs in terms of uh, what, what kind of sexuality aspects you can depict on cable that you can't depict on network TV. Uh, Flora is kind of a weird, morbid, uh, I love her so much in this adaptation. She's obsessed with pirates and shipwrecks. She's a very odd duck. Uh, but Miles is very much framed once again as an older teenager and as being kind of sexually precocious, very kind of, they frame it as if it's flirtatious, but to be frank, he comes across as sexually aggressive, very much along the lines of his own uncle's, uh, you know, quote unquote flirtatious, but in actuality, fairly, uh, fairly chauvinistic and unwanted kind of uh, uh, sexual forwardness. He comes across as like a little libertine relative to his uh, uncle's libertine, uh, which oddly kind of takes the pressure off of Quint to be the manifestation of transgressive sexuality. Uh, Quint is very much uh, the lesser, the lesser of two evils relative to the uncle. And when the governess attempts to kind of object to the environment of sexuality in the house, uh, where the ghosts of Quint and Jessel manifest in her bed, inviting her to a threesome, uh, which is quite a choice. Um, the, uh, the uncle is mostly just peeved that she wants him, uh, that she, she wants him to come out there and interrupt his social life uh, to deal with, you know, horny ghosts. Uh, at the same time, you know, the uncle figure is murdered by Miles, kind of with the idea that uh, Quint wishes to inhabit Miles's body so that he may become the master of Bly and that the uncle is standing in the way of that. Uh, but at the same time, kind of Miles, once again, unambiguously possessed in this case, he kind of takes the active role in his own death by, uh, you know, confronting Quint's ghost, charging off a balcony and dying, uh, which is very... Uh, very unsubtle way to end this narrative, perhaps not Henry James approved, uh, but it is very much uh, in the spirit of some of these adaptations. They love to have Miles uh, fall off of something. Um, I think I'm just going to skip over talking about kind of te uh, specifically televised horror, because uh, it's mostly kind of, you know, we have cable now uh, as a slide. Uh, but in the 1990s and 2000s, we kind of have a further development of kind of the feminist theme of uh, sexual assault as a significant social issue, uh, kind of both increased kind of public disclosures of uh, sexual assault survivorhood uh, by public figures, uh, but also kind of a, uh, accordingly, a pretty harsh backlash to that as being uh, kind of a, a socially unacceptable uh, element of kind of feminist extremism. Uh, we also kind of have an increasing kind of candor around sexuality on TV and film, uh, but we also have kind of, once again, you know, the child stays at the center of that fixation, the idea of uh, adult women and kind of pubescent children in these positions of tension. I'm going to talk about the 1992 made for TV film now. Um, this film is another kind of historical setting update, which I do think says something interesting about uh, how these how these films deal with their Victorianness. It's kind of a 1960s swinging 60s setup uh, where the governess is once again kind of banished to Bly by like a pot smoking uh, uncle who's played by Julian Sands. 
Uh, but in this adaptation, kind of most notably, the governess is a uh, incest survivor. Uh, this is kind of depicted uh, kind of through through heavy suggestion on screen and kind of through her having visions of her father kind of in threatening situations, both in the castle and kind of around the village. Uh, and that kind of colors her perception of uh, Miles's kind of un unpleasant and unwanted kind of sexual innuendo and the play acting between the children. Uh, there's a lot kind of more fetishistic imagery, I would say, in this, kind of a different tenor than in The Nightcomers with its kind of BDSM themes, but there's a lot of, you know, uh, little face masks and lingerie and black leather boots kind of in this adaptation, a little bit more kind of 60s kinkiness, uh, but at the same time, the governess is kind of means of negotiating this uh, potentially kind of destructive sexuality is very much it comes across as if the ghosts are a way of distancing, uh, distancing her, herself from the reality of abuse as a, a temporal happening, something that's happening around her uh, and putting it into the sphere of something that must be supernatural and not, not a consequence of like human agency. We have two more here, 1995's The Haunting of Helen Walker, kind of made for TV on CBS. Uh, controversially, the governess in this is American, and people really, uh, people really take issue with that, even to this day. Uh, but kind of, as I mentioned early on, that I'm not really dealing with kind of uh, psychological dysfunction in the children. These children are very much dysfunctional. They are kind of a difficult charges rather than angelic charges. Uh, and again, kind of the theme of you know sexualized play between the children is very much amplified as either you know. Does this evidence an adult knowledge of sexuality, either due to possession or due to kind of age inappropriate sexual initiation, or is it, you know, a normal thing that kids do that adults are viewing with skepticism due to their own kind of repression and damage? Uh, but ultimately, we come back around to Quentin Jessel being body snatchers. So I guess she was right to be suspicious, uh, which is uh, a little bit of a mixed bag. In the 1999 made for TV film, uh, the kind of the onus of the danger is very much shifted from the ghost to the governess herself. Uh, the governess in this adaptation is depicted as very much a religious zealot uh, and kind of her suspicion as being a means of uh, kind of asserting control and asserting domination, not only over the children, but also over the rest of the household. She's very much uh, herself kind of a uh, demanding assertive figure rather than kind of a mild inquisitor into her surroundings. There's relatively kind of actual sexuality in this film. Colin Firth is there as the uncle and he's hot. Uh, but Quint is also depicted, uh, I would say in some ways, his red hair, his curly red hair making an appearance here made me very happy. Uh, but he also looks like a leprechaun. So I guess once again, we're brought back to kind of stigmatized uh, potential stigmatized Irishness, or just finding a guy with great eyebrows and making him stand on a parapet. Uh, he looks a little bit like Jared Harris in The Terror, which I love. Our first film back in theatrical release in the 2000s is the film In a Dark Place. This film is messy. <laughs> Uh, it is a kind of, again, a modern day set in 2006 adaptation where the main kind of, the main character played by Lily Sob Sobieski is the kind of the, the governess analog in this is an art teacher and her kind of sexually harassing boss uh, refers her to this position as a tutor for an orphan child. Uh, there's a very kind of strong theme of kind of sexual harassment and the objectification of women throughout this uh, as kind of an element that appears to be kind of re-traumatizing the governess uh, throughout the throughout the course of the film. Uh, but at the same time, the the camera the camera work lingers on her body in a significantly like lascivious way, uh, and it kind of undermines any attempt to make a commentary about uh, you know what it means to be in a culture where this can come at you from all sides. Uh, kind of the, the the her employer initially at the school is a is a creep. The uncle is a very casually sexually harassing creep. Uh, Ms. Gross is very clearly attracted to her and doesn't necessarily do right by her. And the children themselves, which is very troubling in this adaptation, that kind of blurs the line between them uh, being victims who are acting out and them being aggressors in their own right. Uh, the governess is really, really kind of becomes increasingly frail as she's kind of put in this, put in this situation that draws out her own kind of traumatic memories. Uh, she attempts to kind of treat Miles and Flora's uh, kind of emotional grief and reticence through what she calls art therapy, but appears to basically just be like, paint whatever is bugging you, uh, which kind of 
it suggests to me that the director is at least conversant in kind of contemporary uh, uh, psychological kind of therapeutic methods for traumatized children, but not necessarily uh, that they fully understand what that would look like. Uh, it's kind of a very all-female setting. Uh, Ms. Gross is kind of the, the central figure of authority at the house, and Quint is positioned as if he is her rival. Uh, he is certainly her rival in love, as she kind of discloses that she was in a, a kind of a high-stakes love triangle between herself, Jessel, and uh, the Quint figure, where uh, she saw him as her kind of hated rival. Uh, the governess in this adaptation is also very clearly, again, uh, a sexual abuse survivor. It is, I would say, most explicit in this adaptation. Uh, we get flashbacks and kind of the visual iconography of stranger danger is very strongly leaned on here. Uh, she experiences uh, kind of emotional disturbance as a result. She experiences uh, what appear to be visions of people who aren't there and experiences periods of missing time, uh, which is very much depicted as if as if she has become unreliable and unstable. Uh, there's kind of a, a, a sex scene where she is staring into the distance, for instance, kind of completely mentally and physically disengaged from what is being done to her. And it once again kind of evokes, uh, evokes her history with sexual assault. At the same time, she is so fetishized by the camera and by the filmmaker uh, that it has a very mixed results. Kind of the, it does not feel like it's a serious treatment of trauma as much as it is uh, kind of a, a treatment of female hysteria as a theme that would feel more suitable for me for like the 1970s rather than seeing this in the 2020, uh, 20, uh, 20, 2000s, goodness gracious. Uh, in this adaptation, Miles and Flora explicitly have discovered Jessel's corpse and are definitely traumatized by that. Uh, in this adaptation also, kind of as the governess kind of decompensates and her mental health uh, really, really suffers, she ultimately kind of terrorizes Miles uh, into uh, taking his own life in the same way that Jessel does, kind of in the lake, which feels, feels like it's saying something, but it's not entirely clear to me what the director believes that he's saying. Uh, in the 2009, we get another kind of very psychological forefront uh, 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 where the psychology element is very much front and center due to the setting in this adaptation. It is updated to kind of 1921, kind of weird Downton Abbey vibes because it stars, um, it also stars, uh, this is killing me, I know her name, Michelle Dockery as the governess. Um, but the framing device is that of a psychiatrist who's questioning the governess as she waits on death row, uh, kind of wait, waiting to be hanged for the murder of uh, her charge, Miles. Uh, the kind of the gendered aspect of psychology is front and center. He's the, the male psychiatrist is explicitly told, why are you wasting this time with women's troubles? Why aren't you dealing with real mental illness? Like the like uh, shell-shocked veterans. And he goes like, okay, like, let me, let me do my thing and you do your thing. Uh, but the gender differentiation in the, in the staff of the house, kind of as all the men have implicitly gone off to war, uh, really brings, really brings kind of the gendered, uh, the idea of gendered traumas and grief as a result of the First World War to the fore, both for the children uh, whose parents have passed, but also for the staff of the household. In this adaptation, the governess's attraction to the uncle is really much foregrounded, and Quint is almost an intruder into those fantasies. Uh, the idea that she might find him attractive seems to be troubling, and that is kind of a, an anxiety that is named by her uh, framing device psychi psychiatrist. Uh, but at the same time, kind of her She's depicted more as a prude than as somebody who is potentially identifying a real sexual threat in the household. For instance, she takes she takes initial issue with uh, Miles and Flora roughhousing because she believes that it looks too sexual uh, for Miles to be on top of his sister. Uh, but quickly, we get an element that appears to shore up the idea of either diegetically as a depiction of what is happening in universe in the haunting or kind of in the governess's own mind, uh, the idea of an adult male voice layering over Miles's voice indicating his possession uh, by Quint more so than a visual of that possession. Uh, in this adaptation, Quint is explicitly uh, both kind of a seducer of women and a sexual predator. Uh, Jessel is kind of singled out as being uh, one of the women of the household who actively enjoyed his attentions, whether or not she actually did or not, uh, by one of uh, the women targeted by Quint otherwise. And that other that other victim, a maid in the household, seems to understand Jessel as kind of a traitor as a result, as having betrayed her fellow women. 
Uh, but at the same time, he's also wildly physically violent toward the women of the household in a way that is pretty shocking. Uh, kind of uh, what the, the maid attempts to relate to the governess is dismissed by gross off kind of out of hand as being, you know, oh, she's lost her, she's lost all the men in her family in the war. She's hysterical now, which is an odd connection to make. But at the same time, the governess clearly uh, takes it to heart that the children may have seen uh, inappropriate things take place and kind of acts of immorality, whatever that may mean uh, in the house in, uh, in her kind of before her arrival there. However, we get a very vivid sense of what that might mean whenever we get a scene of um, Miles is physically, in this scene, he is physically and verbally abusive toward Flora in a way that is very arrestingly adult, very much not, not kind of childish roughhousing, but very much uh, an adult using uh, misogynistic language to demean another, uh, another adult woman. And it's very troubling to see. The governess slaps him across the face and immediately gets herself in trouble uh, because either, either because uh, the, the pre precursor to that was not witnessed or were meant to understand that as being in her mind. Um, this is kind of also the, it's a precipitating incident for kind of Florida, uh, Flora, Florida, good God, uh, Flora uh, kind of decompensating uh, and losing her, losing her composure somewhat is precipitated by uh, Miles shaking her and attempting to drown her. Um, there's also kind of, again, the, the disclosure scene aspects of uh, the governess's confrontation uh, with Miles and later with Quint's ghost is very much at the forefront. Uh, she very much insists on kind of the language of like, you need to name Quint, you need to single him out by name so that I know for sure, uh, which comes across as a little bit loaded kind of in the context of uh, both the both the idea of, of uh, Quint as the agent of Miles's corruption and the idea of him as a sexual aggressor. Uh, but it ultimately ends just as badly as you'd think it would in, in, uh, in a direction that implicates the governess rather than a direction that can be mistaken for uh, Miles destroying himself. There are a lot of critical complaints to this airing kind of as it did over Christmas. And honestly, I cannot blame anyone because the, 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 the foregroundedness of sexual violence as an element of this household setting uh, is pretty, uh, pretty candid, even relative to something like In a Dark Place. I want to talk a little bit about what's happening kind of in trauma during this, these two decades. Uh, thankfully, this is kind of within living memory for, I think, everybody here. Uh, but there's both kind of a increasing suspicion toward, not that there was ever a diminished suspicion toward people who disclosed experiences with alleged assault, uh, but there's very much kind of a through line that uh, surely women must be exaggerating how frequently assault occurs, or surely it can't be as common as it seems to be, and kind of a path pathologization of the assault survivor as kind of a damaged uh, damaged person or particularly a damaged woman uh, in a way that makes her unreliable. However, we're at the same time, we are at sufficient distance from kind of the uh, Jamesian era psychiatry and kind of World War I psychiatry in the case of uh, the 1921 set uh, BBC series to kind of bag on uh, uh, previous psychiatry as being outdated and outmoded, uh, even though the, the kind of contemporary ideas also, uh, uh, also kind of show their age even after only a decade or so. Now we're in the 2010s, so I can finally, I'm finally getting to wrap things up. Uh, in the 2010s, in terms of filmmaking, uh, we're kind of in, an, in the golden age of venues to kind of share one's film, uh, both in kind of streaming video on YouTube, direct to streaming series, and the idea of web platforms that exist almost as a old studio style showcase uh, for projects like Haunting of Bly Manor, which I'll be getting to shortly. Uh, there's also been kind of renewed discourses around sexual violence and sexual trauma. Trauma in general has kind of become uh, a bigger aspect of kind of the public discourse, especially around uh, literature and art. Uh, and there's also kind of a sense of uh, kind of historical abuses and kind of historical workplace uh, sexual violence as something that uh, war warrants kind of a collective response. There's also kind of a reconfiguration of how, how we understand uh, the innocence of children, whether or not it is uh, kind of a, a, a vague spiritual innocence or whether or not it's more in terms of their vulnerability. Um, these locations, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be talking about how they locate and erase trauma. Why did I put these in my bullet, uh, bullet uh, points? Uh, but these, these adaptations, they both 
uh, kind of reify some ideas about trauma and kind of show uh, uh, show aspects of it that had not been previously centered. Uh, the Turning, which came out in 2020, was kind of a, I believe it had a, a relatively long buildup. I was certainly aware of it in advance and kind of uh, apprehensive of how it might uh, how it might handle its subject matter. It is another kind of period piece update, but interestingly, as a period piece update to the 1990s, uh, which makes me have a full body cringe at the idea of that being a period piece now, but at the same time, uh, it very much feels as if it is framing uh, framing this adaptation in terms of a physical isolation that it is taken for granted you can't have in the present day in this era of cell phones. Uh, and then also in terms of being able to research one, one's precursors. Uh, the director of this, uh, Sigismondi, had pretty explicit intentions of creating a feminist film, uh, kind of as stated in interviews surrounding this film and kind of her, her own uh, kind of declaration of what she's attempting to handle in this film. Uh, the biggest element is very much identifying Miles with the idea of toxic masculinity, that he is not only kind of an agent of general wickedness, uh, but that he has very much internalized the mistreatment of women from Quint in a very wholesale manner. And that uh, that kind of, uh, both the idea that abuse itself, you know, someone who is abused may themselves become an abuser, which has kind of become a, 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 a truism or a, an accepted, an accepted uh, phrasing and how people talk about trauma, but also the idea that uh, misogyny is not inherent to men, that it is taught to them by other men, uh, for the most part. Uh, the focus of this film is very much on women. Uh, there's, there's kind of the central uh, focus on the governess, on Ms. Gross, and on Flora. Uh, Flora in this adaptation, she's a little spooky, but she's actually pretty delightful. I would say that this is almost the closest the closest we get in the creepy child era to the charming uh, flora of the novel with, with a special shout out to the one in Haunting of Bly Manor, I'll get to her. Uh, but Miles in this adaptation is kind of a, a really sullen teenager. He is a played by Finn Wolfhard and he is clearly at like in 14 or 15 and really has an attitude problem. Really his withdrawnness is depicted as kind of a sullenness rather than simply a lack of forthcomingness about whatever his relationship with Quint was like. Uh, Quint in this adaptation is very much framed as a misogynist, but he's also framed as kind of a more miscellaneous uh, bad interest on, uh, uh, bad influence on Miles. Like he brings Miles with him out drinking when Miles is underage, for instance, and he kind of disappears with Miles for indeterminate periods of time where nobody knows what they're doing together, uh, which, to me, definitely does not not suggest an element of trauma there that wh whatever happened there has has marked kind of uh, Miles's development, but it's very much first and foremost framed in terms of uh, educating him uh, in hatred of women. Uh, the governess in this adaptation, there is another kind of very gothic conceit, uh, which is that Miss Jessel kept a diary <laughs> and that uh, the governess herself can open it up kind of scrutinize the writing in it and learn more about the circumstances under which Jessel died and the circumstances under which uh, Quint died whenever she confronts Gross with this information. Essentially in this adaptation, Jessel is not, you know, not a, a death from suicide, not a death by misadventure or from pregnancy, uh, but she is unambiguously murdered by Quint. Uh, and uh, Gross uh, volunteers the information that she murdered. Uh, she murdered Quint as revenge for that and to kind of to protect the reputation of the family, but in effect, uh, kind of for the defense of another woman uh, as in the household. Uh, in this adaptation, kind of there's the, the other forms of non-sexual child trauma are also at the forefront. Uh, there's very much the aspect of, you know, Flora has witnessed her parents' death in a vehicle accident, and she has panic attacks whenever she enters a car, which I felt was, you know, very, very much putting that in uh, immediate terms, kind of the idea of this is not, not a nebulous sphere, but a very concrete kind of somatized reaction. Uh, and Miles is very much grieving Quint, you know, no matter what kind of man Quint seems to have been, Miles seems to really be feeling his loss uh, in, a, in an un uncommonly deep way. Uh, Miles's presence is foreshadowed in this film by the image of violence against women uh, when the governess is being led by Flora through her mother's sewing room they discover a sewing dummy uh, with pins meticulously thrust through its breasts, which is this really, really uncanny and very suggestive image of kind of gendered violence, which 
uh, we're informed Miles is responsible for. And it is very much kind of a, a prelude to the kind of disturbed teen treatment of Miles we get in this story. Uh, Quint is depicted as kind of animalistic uh, and very much an intruder uh, in this adaptation, very much kind of a, a violator of women's and children's personal spaces. Uh, we also get an element in this of the idea of overheard voices, uh, not simply not simply seeing people where you don't expect to see them, but hearing people where you don't expect to hear them, uh, where uh, Jessel's voice and vo Jessel's protests against kind of the her attack by Quint are uh, physically manifesting throughout the house. Uh, the governess herself is again, you know, a, a survivor of non-specific childhood trauma in this case, uh, but is kind of located as being a site for of identification for her with the children. It kind of makes her better at taking care of them rather than worse, uh, which is nice for a change. At the same time, this film very much does not stick the landing in terms of wrapping up its gothic conclusions. Uh, the way that this film ends is with an abrupt pivot to the idea that the governess figure has inherited a uh, destructive mental illness. And then in fact, everything she thinks she's seen uh, is a psychotic experience. And it is very much an old school, what if it was all in her mind? What if she was crazy treatment of mental illness that frankly, like is a real letdown after a fairly, uh, fairly serious and fairly uh, sincere treatment of kind of uh, Quint as a, as a workplace sexual harasser up until that point. Uh, it is very much reshoring up the idea of the hysterical woman, and it is so, uh, so much of a dramatic uh, undercut of the rest of the story that it honestly makes me wonder uh, if that was an external imposition on this narrative. It really sucks, and it's a real bummer for what is otherwise uh, a surprisingly, uh, a surprisingly uh, complex film in terms of how it's trying to deal with the age of its subject matter. Uh, in terms of, I was going to be talking here about kind of uh, what does it mean for a director to be making an explicitly feminist film in the case of Floria Sigismondi, uh, but I do not have time for that. So I'm going to power on to The Haunting of Bly Manor on Netflix. Uh, this is kind of the newest of these adaptations, and it came fast on the heels of The Turning in a way that I think uh, suggested to some people unfavorable comparisons either way. Uh, it kind of takes place in a very layered uh, kind of Henry James short story shared cinematic universe where all these narratives taken from different short stories are kind of uh, forged into a single narrative. Uh, the narrative that is forged there is interestingly uh, one that is both very much devoid of kind of the, the eroticism and sexual tension uh, with the governess figure and with the children. Uh, but it is also one that removes kind of the responsibility for kind of uh, harassing and bedeviling the children onto another ghost entirely. Uh, it is a very interesting kind of adaptational choice uh, to kind of both to tie Turn of the Screw to another James story, uh, but also to allow, allow for Miss Jessel to be uh, held as a figure who is not necessarily blameworthy. Um, the element of sexual abuse in this adaptation, the only element I could detect directly uh, is in Quint's backstory. Quint comes from an abusive household and he is, uh, you know, seeking, seeking to obtain money to kind of pay off uh, his sexually abusive father and his mother who kind of was complicit in the abuse by not addressing it in any way. I thought this was very interesting in terms of depicting, you know, adult survivors of sexual abuse who are not uh, first, first and foremost uh, female and secondly, you know, depicted as frail and uh, hysterical. Uh, he's very much a kind of hmm, quote unquote dark, quote unquote damaged figure, but at the same time, he's very uh, active and very much uh, depicted as kind of uh, gender conformingly male. Uh, but his relationship with Jessel is very much kind of of two minds. They're very much split down the middle how they want to treat it, whether it is kind of a a romantic plot that you can get invested in between two people who are just at the wrong time in the wrong place, or whether uh, Quint is emotionally abusing her, whether he's taking advantage of Jessel as kind of a, a young woman with uh, real hopes and dreams that are being uh, kind of sidelined by, by sexism and by racism and uh, kind of twisting her arm to make her do things she wouldn't otherwise do. Uh, the kind of the, this adaptation goes very, very heavily on the broader staff in the household and kind of bringing in characters who are only mentioned or only, you know, only a name drop in the novel, uh, which I thought was interesting. And there's also pains taken to depict other kind of healthier adult relationships 
uh, in addition to the relationship between Quint and Jessel. Uh, the, the governess figure is kind of having a slow burn romance uh, with uh, the butch super sweet gardener at the house. She's kind of discovering uh, disco discovering her own queerness and kind of liberating herself from compulsive, compulsory heterosexuality. Uh, but at the same time, kind of, uh, there's this very positive male figure in the form of Owen, who's kind of modeling, modeling a kind of masculinity that doesn't involve necessarily uh, manipulating or threatening women. <laughs> uh, Miles in this adaptation, however, is very much depicted as violently disturbed. His kind of actions in school involve, uh, you know, kind of troubling, troubling violence and troubling uh, actions toward other children. Uh, but that in itself is not it didn't really feel conclusively addressed either as a uh, psychological phenomenon or as an aspect of the haunting. He's very much depicted as kind of uh, traumatized by the experience of grief and the loss of his parents and the loss of Gross and Jessel, not Gross and Jessel, Quentin Jessel. Um, but uh, there's this enduring element of using kind of a time loop as a grief metaphor. This adaptation gets very weird toward the tail end, which I appreciated, but found uh, uncommon kind of using the idea of uh, being trapped in a particular time and place as a metaphor in itself for a kind of uh, experience of grief where you are displaced, uh, temporarily displaced from uh, time as you're currently experiencing it or as kind of a metaphor for bereavement. Uh, the only kind of element of sexuality involving the children is once again kind of the, the element that Quint and Jessel want to inhabit their bodies unambiguously to possess them and to reinitiate their sexual relationship, uh, which is weird and gross because they're children and they're also siblings. Uh, but that's very much, that's very much a small note relative to the way that that element uh, has been centralized in other adaptations. They very much have a, a non-incestuous sibling relationship in the staging. I guess if I, have a, if I have like two minutes left here, kind of talking about what we've seen in these adaptations that we haven't seen before, uh, the focus on women in these adaptations is really very much feeling, feels like it reflects a kind of developing cinematic sensibilities, especially with women directors, uh, but also uh, kind of a, a shift in focus from the, the governess as kind of an inquisitor figure to her as somebody who's essentially, uh, who's kind of good, good intentions and good nature are being more taken for granted in these 2010 adaptations than they have previously with her being depicted as a really kind of a vehement, a, a vehement zealot or more of a, uh, a, a, a paranoid, suspicious person. Um, I also appreciate that these both have uh, spooky little floras, kind of uh, spooky child representation in a more positive direction. Uh, kind of across these decades, the big thing that we kind of see is both uh, directors operating under kind of the content limitations of their own formats, whether that is kind of what they have a budget to depict or what censors will permit them to depict. But they're also kind of very much drawing on kind of contemporary understandings of trauma as a phenomenon of sexuality and of sexual violence. Uh, in some cases, kind of the director's own intentions of what type of story they intend to tell very much are driving that. But for the most part, I think these are uh, more reflective of broader contemporary attitudes than kind of an auteur style drive uh, to depict one thing or another about trauma. Talking about kind of where can we go next? I'd love to talk about this kind of when we have our questions and answers, but for me, I know I want more flora content. I want more content dealing with uh, kind of Miles's quote unquote misconduct at school, especially uh, dealing with that in the light of, of kind of queerness and queer childhood where any form of uh, queer sexuality, no matter how age appropriate it may be, is kind of understood as uh, inappropriate for any situation. Uh, and even kind of dealing with flora and or miles as kind of adult survivors of trauma themselves, uh, and anything kind of dealing more with the role of Jessel, both her as kind of a, a complicit party in uh, Quint's transgressions and as a figure who is herself transgressed against by Victorian standards. I just wanted to show you guys this graphic really quick. <laughs> All right, thanks. Thanks everyone for coming. I think we're gonna have a moment here for questions, but I needed to show you that. <laughs> 